Este episodio está patrocinado por nuestros compas de Casa Humilde Cervecería. Cerveza artesanal, elaborada aquí en Chicago, with a variety of 10 different styles to choose from. Casa Humilde is located at the District Brew Yards, 417 North Ashland in Chicago. Follow them on IG and like them on Facebook at Casa Humilde Cervecería. To check availability near you, go to www.casahumildechicago.com and check out the store locator. You could also pick up some chelas at the District Brew Yards. Casa Humilde Cervecería. Stay humilde. Este episodio está patrocinado por Tequila Tres Generaciones. At Tres Generaciones, we honor those driven to create something greater than themselves, those who have what it takes to leave a legacy. It's a tequila for the strivers, the hustlers, the champions of free will who create their destiny and don't await it. El proceso es único. It begins with fresh pressing agave, extrayendo el jugo antes que lo cocinen, resulting in reduced bitterness and a crisp agave forward flavor. Todo el tequila is triple distilled using 100% Blue Weber agaves. Con el tequila blanco, con el tequila reposado, it's certified organic. Aquí en el Wack Pod, cuando hacemos un brindis, it has to be tequila tres generaciones. Celebrate responsibly. 40% alcohol by volume. Copyright 2021 Salsa Tequila Import Company. Chicago, Illinois. This Wack Pod episode is brought to you by Borja's Law Group. El abogado Borjas contestará todas tus preguntas, explicará el proceso específico de inmigración que aplica en su caso, el tiempo que se toma procesar su caso y los costos asociados con las tarifas de inmigración y los honorarios legales. Llama al 312-788-2783 para programar tu cita. Y ahí de pasada, menciona el WACPAR para que te den tu consulta gratis. This episode is brought to you by Taquerías a Totonilco. Con más de 40 años de experiencia, hoy por hoy de los mejores tacos al pastor en todo Chicago y suburbios. Al igual con los tacos de asada, ni más ni menos. Sus famosas tortas y para terminar con ganas, un rico licuado. Les encargamos sus tres locales, 3916 al oeste de la 26 en Chicago, 500 East Cass Street en Joliet y 1631 al norte de la Mannheim Road en Stone Park. Para más información, visite www.taqueriasatotonilco.com. This episode is brought to you by Rancho Los Guzman. Hands down, one of the most beautiful rancho-style venues there is in the Chicagoland area. They offer all the necessary services so that your next event is unforgettable. From weddings, quinceañeras, VIP private events, and holiday corporate events. Relax and enjoy while they take care of every single detail. Book your next event at Rancho Los Guzman, 2225 Maple Road in Joliet. For more information, call 815-200-4713 or check out their website at rancholosguzman.com. Buenos días, buenas tardes, buenas noches. Su compa Carlos Rodríguez. What's up, everybody? Yo soy Jesse el Grandote. ¿Cómo estamos? Mira nomás, mi compa Jesse. Yo nos tocó. Not... We're missing Fry today. We're missing Fry We're today. We're going to start I'm, off with I'm, that. I'm a little bit upset why Fry is not here, but... Uh, oh, oh, there, there he, he is. is. Yeah. There he is. There he is. Well, Behind you, the you scenes. can leave now. You can leave now. We're, we're good As now. long as the camera is good. As yeah. long well, as yeah. Jesse looks great. I'm, do I look skinny? All right. Nah. Yeah. <laughs> Ah, no, no. He makes me look good in pictures, man. I got to give him to that, pero... You're naturally beautiful, bro. Gracias, gracias. It's the the little main... What is it? Uh, what Marisol Terrazas called me? The Silver Fox. Silver Fox. That's silver right. Silver Fox. It was probably like a silverback gorilla or something like that, pero... <laughs> <laughs> pero no, casi, man. es primo hermano. Eso, eso. Yeah. Hey, man, shout out to you guys, man. Thank you. Uh, we're back at it again with this extra walk, man. He, he, and I'm a little bit excited for, for this extra walk. Okay. Porque... Este, we we had to bring out the coffee. And yeah, it's a coffee today. I, I, coffee mugs are on their way. I, I, I gotta get It'll a coffee mug. Thirty two ounce, thirty two <laughs> ounce, yeah. por favor, porque yo necesito un tamaño grandote. Ahora sí queremos explicar que este extra guac episode of, of our season four, um, it's a little bit different because we're starting a new segment called Caso Mildes Pick. And that's not a nose pick, right? No, 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 no. Okay. This is Caso Mildes Pick, where uh, Jose and Javier Lopez from Caso Milde, este. Salud. 
Uh, this the last season, Salucita, is that they had brought us uh, Omar Cillo, Omar right, Ramos. Right, right, right. Shout out. And uh, we decided this season to incorporate an actual Casa Humildes pick where they bring somebody on the extra guac episode okay. at the end of the season. Nice. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be in the music scene. It's a little bit different in the aspect where we do want to drop a lot of knowledge because I'm all about dropping knowledge yes. to our community. But, but I'm excited about our oh, guest si, today si, porque si, si. Aparte... I'm nervous, man. Well, don't be nervous, <laughs> man. I called Jesse today, <laughs> no, and I'm man. like, man, you know what? I started I started watching all these YouTube videos, and I'm like, holy shit. Like, this guy's just amazing, and he's got like, you know, he's got so much so much stuff going on, and I'm like, my, my brain's fucking overworking. But and... it's funny because it's, it's al revés. Like, what, if you guys know us in our personal life, yo soy al revés. Like, I, when I'm worried, bro, Carlos, hey, man, I don't oh know, God, and, I'll, and I'll be, and, and yeah. so I did the same way. Like, <laughs> just relax, bro. Just be yourself. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm excited because aquí nuestro invitado es una, it's a household name, not just in Chicago, but in the whole state of Illinois, Correct. probably the USA, man. So yes, sir. He, he's uh, hit up the top ranks, and I'm, I'm actually excited. Uh, I, I mean, I saw him in the news. I see him everywhere. And like I said, it's a household name, and uh, I'm actually excited to, to chop it up with him today. Man, I am as well. Uh, queremos que le den una muy buena bienvenida a nuestro invitado de honor, uh, al señor Luis Gutierrez, hey! ex congressman. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome, welcome How to the Watt Pod. Hey, I'm good. I'm with. <laughs> I'm with. I'm here. I'm good. Thank you for the invitation. No, no, oh, gracias, you. gracias. No. We we really didn't think somebody. Well, I mean, yo yo lo veo con tanto respeto de, yeah. de tu magnitud, like right. your presence, your just not social media, but it's it's like your TV presence, your yeah. political presence. Like, mm. oh man, we're. We have somebody in the walk pod over here, man. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. We brought we brought the big guns, basically. My, 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 my daughter Jessica and her husband Eso. David are your fans. Salud, oh, saluda la sección, saluda la sección. They're part of the sección yeah. today. Sección, oh, yeah. Yeah. They're part of the sección. Yeah. So they, yeah, they told me all. But they've been talking to me for like two years about you guys. Nice. Oh, okay, okay, Thank and, you. Blah, and then I got Appreciate the invitation, that. and I said, well. I've heard such great things. Let me go meet them in person. Yeah, so, awesome. No, well, you got to do the full experience, but off camera and off, cam and off microphone. The behind the scenes. Okay. Behind the scenes. Yeah. Super okay. underground. Okay. Okay. That's wow. when you get the full walk That's experience. Okay. Well, whatever, whatever, whatever uh, I'm sure um, uh, PG-rated version. Right. Um, That's what it is right now. Though. That's what it will be. Okay. No, pero bienvenido. Gracias. Gracias. Este, no, gracias. Yes, aquí Chicago. Uh, it's raining, and you, yep. you made it through over here. So we, we really appreciate you first and foremost. Hey, thank <laughs> you know, thanks to the, it, you know, thirty years ago it would have been tough, but yeah. today the telephone kind of gets you here, right? I said, I said, thirty years, no más tardes así como. No, I remember when they used to print it up. And oh, Matt Quest, here, Congressman, Matt and Quest, you, and then you. You Maybe had your old house. An accident, you'd have yeah. to pay yeah. until you go here. And if you well, miss it, your it turn. Worked. Right. But espérate, antes de eso, we used to, look, I'm 68. <laughs> I remember when I used maps. Maps. Actual maps. Yeah. And then made a line. Yeah. Where you was, you follow the, the trip. You say, yeah. mi, mi, mi papá no, I no go, le gustaba I go, viajar. Okay, first we're going to go here. Yeah. And then from here. <laughs> so to get to L.A., our first stop was oh, usually uh, like Nebraska, right? Mm -hmm. We'd stop in Nebraska. We're tired. <laughs> then the next stop is Denver. Right. My then God. after that, you think you're gonna get to LA next, nope. and somewhere in those mountains, you get tired <laughs> and you pull into one of those, you know, whatever hotel sixes, <laughs> yeah. and you get there, and then you know, and and oh, the, oh you get to Las Vegas. Yeah, I remember Las Vegas, then LA. Yeah. Pero todo eso con un mapa. Right now, right. I remember one of the last times my dad hates flying, and este y este íbamos a México de Chicago manejábamos a Guadalajara Jalisco. Wow! And it was a two day trip. Wow! We would fight with my sisters, you know, not taking a shower for two days. So it was like wow. Every time we got to Texas, we're like, okay, you know, we're we're here. Y luego, this is our next day trip. We got to outline it. But my sister lost her map. <laughs> and we're in the middle of Texarkana, Texas. What? And I'm like, hey, uh, how do we get to Dallas or how do we get to San Antonio? And the guy's like, buy a map. I'm buy like, oh, <laughs> come on. Yeah, man. You, you got to buy a map. That's the way you did it <laughs> back yeah. then. And we used, so I had a lot of wonderful, and I do it again, except at 68, it's tough. You know, to drive that many hours. How? How? I'm uh, talking. I was like, I was in my 30s, yeah. right? Mm. 
So we say, ah, let's go to Disneyland. Disney, let's go to L.A. And, of course, <laughs> all my kids wanted to, can we go to East L.A.? I said, why do you come to L.A.? The tacos. The tacos. We better, go, tacos. I, we better, we better <laughs> go to East L.A. So we used to go there, and we'd drive there. And I think it was, if I remember, it's like Denver, Las Vegas. Yeah. So we spent two days in Las wow. Vegas. I still remember at Bochorno, right? <laughs> because we go, Las Vegas was different, okay? Back there then, were 30 lot, years yeah, ago? There were, there were a lot of like cabarets in the hotels, okay. right? So there'd be a, a band with a singer. And, you know, for a dollar, you, <laughs> even less, you buy a drink, right? And, and I still remember the guy was singing the song, right? <laughs> You've lost that love and feeling. He was singing it good. Mm. So he's getting everybody in the audience. And you know me, Sangano, right? <laughs> Notice I did not say pendejo. <laughs> uh, I don't want to offend any of your poor No, no, my followers. dad used to like calling me that when I was young. Sangano, <laughs> okay. so, 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 of course, I, he's, I'm singing along and I'm thinking I'm one of the righteous brothers, right? Blah, blah. He comes over. <laughs> he says, come on, finish the song. I'm like, what? Get, put get on, on your spot, knees man. now. Get on your knees and sing. Who's this? Your wife? Sing to her. Uh, <laughs> no me salía nada. And my wife was like, that was embarrassing, honey. I said, I didn't go there to sing the song. I went there to go listen to it. So it was different. Right. I, I, I enjoyed it more. Yeah. Right? And so we stopped. We had a good time in November in Denver. We had a great time in Las Vegas. We had a wonderful time. And then we went south. Okay. Right? So we went through New Mexico. Wow. And Arizona. We stopped in Oklahoma City. They had like real cowboys. And a real like cowboy, you know, rodeo. Right. And we stayed there. Uh, so all I know is I got to experience America. Mm-hmm. I never understood the Ronald Reagan commercials, right? Where they would just have like Ronald Reagan with these beautiful vistas of America. Yeah. With the music, right? And then the, uh, the American flag in the background. In the very, and you know, I never got those commercials because I was a city kid. Right. Right. So, you know, it's like the asphalt and concrete jungle. Yeah. Right, but if I get why Ronald Reagan did that, right? Because okay. once you drive, it's a pretty beautiful country. Yeah, you start right. driving out there in those open fields of corn and wheat. You look to those mountains. I mean, and then you go through this. It's a, it's a beautiful pasaje. And guess what? I, I think he wasn't looking for me to vote for. Okay, <laughs> so he was kind of looking for the people in Oklahoma, and Nebraska. Oh, like yeah. yeah, he was yeah. looking for. So he was, he was. He was showing them an America I never got. I used to drive, but if you drive from here east to New York, it's okay. <laughs> but it's going west. It's otra it's, cosa. It's otra cosa bellísima. Yeah. How, how, uh, how savvy are you with your cell phone? Uh, ahorita, now, nowadays, this thing, wow. how, how, I mean, are you the guy that pulls over and you're like, uh, mm, uh, boom, I will tell you what. <laughs> I, now that you say that, on the way here, yeah. Um, I, I listened to uh, Querida and um, and um, by like Juan Gabriel. Yeah. Oh. yeah, it's beautiful. I I really like it and and then I, I didn't know how to play it again because I have an old Toyota Corolla. <laughs> I know I'm Puerto Rican. I'm supposed to you know ninety two okay. or ninety four. <laughs> no, no, we uh, we up. Okay, brother, we upgraded it. Okay? Oh, oh up- it's yes. newer. Oh yeah, man, it, 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 I'm, this, I'm such a nice This was a 2014. <laughs> okay, <laughs> 2014. It's old. Hey, but with I, the I prices was, of used car, oh, man, I could sell it for some good money these yeah, days. Yeah, oh, I'm like, well, really? I bought good this for like it. I bought this for like nine. You mean I could sell it for 12? <laughs> 12? That's inflation. Uh, yeah. When yeah. you can sell your Toyota Corolla <laughs> for more money. No, but I love the old Toyota Corollas, so, the boxy ones, man. Right. I like the. So I had I. I, don't worry, I've had my share of Toyota Corollas <laughs> in my life. But anyways, so I did pull over, so I, I did, not that savvy, but okay. I know how to put I, I know how to put on the Spotify and uh, nice. and tell it you know the random, and I just put uh, uh, the ones that you check that you uh, that you like. The you're like, oh, you're yeah, like, yeah, yeah. So I just go to like, like playlist. Yeah, Boom. Like playlist. So you like you like a song, you listen to something, and you just put like. I put like, yeah. and so now I know. That's why I, I love Spotify. Or I can listen to I, I your it. favorite songs of 2021. Or your daily mix. <laughs> or your, you know, but I, on the way here to see you guys, I did the like. What's uh, what's on your like what playlist? What is on the like playlist? Well, yeah. you know, so uh, so I did my Mexican stuff. So okay. I have my, um, I, I like, uh, No Tengo Dinero. I love that song. Okay. I mean, and Querida. I, so I think music and what you like, uh-huh. a lot of it has to do with your youth. 
Okay. I don't know if it's like that for other people, but for me, mm. if you looked at it, you say, wow, got a lot of shy lights, temptation, Smokey Robinson and the Miracles. Mm. It looks like he must have bought stock in Motown. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. He's downloaded a lot of that, you know? Not too much Jackson 5, okay? okay. Even though they're from Gary, Indiana. Right. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> they, Michael didn't really, you know, do it for me. Okay? He didn't do it for you? No, he didn't. Yeah. I mean, I like the stuff, but it's not the kind of stuff that's on my like list, right? Yeah. right? But the old, you know, from my, when I was 14, 15, 16 years old. So what else do you find? Because I'm Latino. So if you go back to 1969, okay. 1970, like who the hits coming from? They're coming from Jose Jose. Okay. They're coming from Armando Manzanero, mm. who could write the most, as beautiful wrote songs. the most beautiful yeah. romantic. And you're 16 years old. Right. What do you gravitate to? Right. I mean, I had the Beatles. I want to hold your hand. <laughs> right. I had Armando Manzanero. Esta tarde vi llover. Right. Vi gente correr y no estabas tú. Yeah. Right. I mean, if you take yeah. it's, it, it was more poetry. Yeah. So. That's what I have a lot of. And then later, salsa. Okay. Right? So, you know, I got to put, I got my, my, sal your, my, your... my salsa mix in there. So, it's really eclectic. Okay, I'll confess. I'm modern. I'm as modern as Ed Sheeran. Okay? I do have him. <laughs> on my, you, got on some, my, you got him. Okay. I, I got him. He's about as modern but, as I But can. Uh, what I want to know for, uh, <laughs> todo respeto a todos los boricuas, uh -huh. but is Mark Anthony the god of salsa? You know uh, what? Is he the He or? is, for me, for you. he's like the best known. Okay. Right? To me. He's the best known. Now, like I would mate? tell you, to me, mm -hmm. when I think of salsa, yeah. I think of Eddie Palmeri. Okay. okay? Um, and I think of Hector Lavos, right, right? right? I go back a ways. But if you listen, and anybody goes, you know, you're watching, listen to this podcast. Podcast after the podcast, <laughs> go look up Eddie Palmetti, yeah. right? And you're gonna find Malagueña Salerosa was a perfect it, song, right the, there. The, and yes, and not only that, <laughs> the piano, the piano, and the instrumentation, yeah. and what they do with violins, yeah, right. Yeah. <clears throat> They don't do that in salsa today. No, right? no. I, I think it was just the fusion. Lo, lo que era en, la, en los setentas, or like La Fania, or where they yes, tried to. The Fania also. It was, it, was that, um, it was that salsa, that right. little mix, that they wanted to do like orchestra music with, you know, um, sounds from, you know, from like Afro-Cuban beats and yeah. stuff like that. Is that, is that what yeah, I'm getting? Yeah, so, yes. Yeah, so the Afro-Cuban Not, not Afro-Cuban, I'm and, sorry, but like. And then, of course. Uh, uh, um, you can't be there without Cuatro Cuarenta, right? Right. And listening and to Juan Luis Minute. Guerra. Yeah. I mean, I got Juan Luis Guerra just for all the Juan Luis yep. Guerra. It's in my likes, right? Well, well I'm gonna probably, I, I'm gonna probably play a little game, like a little, little. Uh, I see impromptu little okay. game. So let, let's see who who you like a little bit better de, okay. de los artistas. Okay. Este, uh, Willie Colon or Mark Anthony? Wow, that man! I know it's, why you got to go do hard. We got to do it. Why do you got to? I got to put him on the spot. But, but, but Willie, Willie Coron is like the father, of and then course. you want me to choose between the father or and is the it son. Two, is it two different levels? <laughs> it's two different. Okay, it's, so you can't choose. I, it's it's just two. <laughs> there were two different times. Oh, okay, so One, so let's go. So Willie Colon, I think I met my wife. Right. Uh -huh. Mm. We're going to a concert in Chicago up on the north side yeah. at the Aragon. There you go. Oh, and we're going, oh yeah. I, I know I'm, I'm dating for everybody that's not in their 60s because you had to be, you, you know, I, I'm talking, right? Because what I'm talking about right. is 70s, 80s. Because yeah. I don't know if the Aragon's done anything lately. No, yeah, it's, it's, still those, it's, okay, still those, back, it's still there. Back in those, back, well, it shows you how, much, how many concerts <laughs> I go to. But back then, you know, you'd go to the concert. Yeah. They'd have, uh, uh, they, they, they've had Eddie Palmetti there, yeah. right? Okay. And you dance. They close the joint down at 4 o'clock. Yeah. And it's like the day began again. Because mm -hmm. I think everybody went to breakfast <laughs> after around dancing. There, around, yeah. 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 I, you, oh, yo, I used to go back to the neighborhood, right? Because uh -huh. I said, no, no, I'm going to aquí. <laughs> so I used to go back to the neighborhood. And the best thing was that the Mexican restaurants, Yeah. I mean, they're so industrious, right? <laughs> they stay open 24 hours, yeah. bro. They're well, open. It was it was funny. Shout out to my <laughs> boy uh, Carritas, eh? Carritas on Pedro. What <laughs> I would do is I would party all the way to 4 a.m. Yes. Y luego cerramos el lugar. Yes. Y luego my Carrita place on 18th Street in okay. Pilsen. 
was opening up at 5 a.m. So I would just take like a little 20 minute nap, and then he would be like, It's ready. Come on in. It's Come ready. ready. Let's ready. go. <laughs> 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 can, can I tell you something? We share an experience. Yeah. So I can't. Here's my problem. If I want to go to a nightclub, uh-huh. since they don't start the music till 10, 30, 11 o'clock, yes. I've learned, right? <laughs> I virtually have to take Damn a nap DJs. at like 5 o'clock. Yeah, but I want that. Acuéstate a dormir ahora so that nap. you can wake up at 9 and you go, you know, if you ever go to sleep early, for anybody that's gone to sleep too early, you know you wake up at 9 and now you can't go back to sleep. Right. Right. <laughs> well, under that operating procedure, right? Then I can maybe go to the nightclub. Yeah, yeah. But it, you know, hey, with age, you have your memories. Of so I have wonderful memories of days of going out dancing, and I still remember. I took, I took, I, I took my wife. Uh, I met her. I asked her for a date. She finally said yes. And uh, <laughs> seriously, it was, it was a little trial there uh, to get her to say yes. And um, and I still remember. I, I had like all the evangelical girls at Northeastern. Mm-hmm. They all went to her and prayed on her and, you know, and said, said, no, porque él tiene el diablo. El diablo, él es el malo. diablo. Es a socialista. <laughs> He's a socialist, leftist. You don't want, you know. Anyways, uh, wow. but she finally went out with me. And I remember the first time I took her out to dance. And I, th- and I said to myself, take it easy. You know, this girl's always at home. She rarely goes out. Don't, don't show bust, all your don't moves. Don't bust out the moves. You know, don't, don't you know I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to be sw- swinging, you know, too complicated. <laughs> So I swang, and okay, she came back, and I swang this way, and then I figured on one thing that I learned about my wife, you know, at 45 years old, she likes to lead, because I had to tell her from time, mira, déjame, I have, I'm <laughs> She's getting She's the one confused. who dipped you afterwards, so then all the song su- was done. All of a sudden, I'm <laughs> noticing that there's these turns, and I'm like going... <laughs> Oh, esta no está en su casa los sábados. <laughs> Era buena muchacha, but she she goes out to dance. She dances. Nice, clearly, nice. clearly, I haven't met her at any of the clubs, <laughs> yeah. but that's just that's, that's it's, it's 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 not because she hasn't been out. So I still remember. So I have such beautiful, yeah. fond memories of nice. dancing. And so that's what awesome. did we dance to? We danced to salsa. Salsa. And then merengue. Okay. So those were the two that we danced to. Right. Right. Um, we didn't like. We didn't do the grind them ups and the stuff from the <laughs> 60s and, the, you know, with the shy lights and, and the temptations and all the rest of it. Five them, guys, right? one microphone, you know, <laughs> yeah. everybody on the stage. Right, and everybody. Everybody, right, everybody's dancing and one guy's singing. So I think your music, yeah. a lot of it has to do with being a reflection of your youth. Right. Mm-hmm. So a lot of my stuff is Jose Jose, Armando Manzanero. Obviamente, that's how No Tengo Dinero and Querida gets in there, right? So it's 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 music from some time ago. Right. And and then there's a lot of Motown, because right. that's my music. Oh, wait a minute. The Beatles. ¿Cómo puedo dejarlo ese pobrecito fuera? You don't want to know about my youth, about what I grew up to, because if that's a reflection of what I used to listen to yes. when I was young... Chacho, bro. Are you still yeah. listening? Is that still your I still, likes? I still like, yeah, yeah. I still like it. And then I, I'm teaching my, my son about it. Yes. And it's it's a bad influence, so. No, but can I tell you something? <laughs> my 18-year-old grandson, uh-huh. I've taught him some really nice jams from the 60s. Uh-huh. And I tell him, mira, Esto. cuando está con la novia, tú sabes, está ahí, ponle esta canción. And he's learned the lyrics. Wow. He says, Grandpa, that's a good hint. Yeah. I said, that and the other thing that's really going to impress your girlfriends is if you make sure the syrup is hot when you serve the pancakes. <laughs> and, of course, my daughter my daughter says, how come you're always teaching my son, your grandson? I said, somebody's got to teach him about some, the, somebody gotta tell the him. pancakes. Right. No, I was I was listening to Cypress Hill when I was growing up, man. Okay. Just hip hop, street nineties hip hop. Oh, well, okay. was just a different genre, it, different it is era. A di- so I skipped See, that. Yeah, and I yeah. skipped much of, um, um, of of today's music. So okay. I do. I mean, I I will listen so, to so can to we music. Com- can we compare Tito Nieves with Victor Manuel? Or t- another two different levels. You know, because- but I so Victor Manuel is my is. Is the person I dance to. Okay. Right? Okay. I know Tito Nieves, great, but so Victor, if I was going out with my wife, we'd definitely go to... Uh, to Victor Manuel's concert. Yeah, we gotta, <laughs> we gotta, we gotta, we gotta go there. Yeah, that's like, where I would... No, I'm a Tito Nieves guy. Okay. Like, I gotta go to his concert Tito, all the time. And, and the thing about Tito is it's easier for me to dance 
to him because it's yeah, slower. It's slower, but he's a he's a Boricua Pavarotti man. I, well, I, before I, I, I mean, I, he was I, when he was. I fat. agree. I agree with you. <laughs> but you know, we didn't come here to lie. Ah, I gotta tell you the truth. I, so so, I, so, me, I, I got you. I start thinking if I'm going to a concert and I'm dancing with my wife, Huma, that's the music yeah. we're going to. Because again, it's a reflection of your youth. Right. Yeah. What did you dance to? Right. What did you? Who, when you fell in love, what was the music of the yeah. moment? Well, I like that. What well, when um, a little bit of my background is, I was having to start when I was on the radio. Uh-huh. <laughs> when I was oh, in the radio station, este, le tengo un, un cariño mucho, un cariño mucho a la gente puertorriqueña, especialmente aquí en Chicago, porque uh, they've always embraced me when when we do the the you know the Puerto Rican fest uh, or yeah. este los festivales allá en Humble yeah. Park. Yeah. Pero I uh, shout out to Miguel Vasquez, el monstro, he's the one who taught me about salsa music. Okay. And one of the loves of salsa music, when, if you tell me, what's your favorite artist? Uh-huh. El Gran Combo. Oh, el Gran no, Combo. de Puerto Rico, el Gran, el Gran Combo. Pero yo puedo bailar al Gran Combo all night. Really? I, <laughs> because, again, although they may have started in my parents' you know, uh, adulthood, uh, uh, right? Mm-hmm. right? But el Gran Combo, they have, it's like, uh, how would I say it? It's like the Temptations. Okay. You know, maybe they I ain't never, all the I same. I never saw it like that. I know, that. Maybe, they, maybe they ain't all the same guy, but when they <laughs> sing My Girl, you go, all right. That's, right. Um, that's, that's El Gran Combo. Wow. They have a music that I believe just goes from generation to generation to generation. Right. So the Gran Combo could be my dances, my, my parents' dance combo. Wow. But they could be mine, too. Yeah. And they, they're still around. They're still around? I don't know if it's the same dudes in the band, no, okay? No, but I but, mean, after Andy Montañez left, it was just... Okay. But so Andy, <laughs> I love... You Peace. know what I, I love about him, too? Is that he's also very committed to social justice. Okay. So, so you know, um, so when I think of, um, you know, um, Calle Trece, right? Yeah. And I think of their commitment to social justice. I, you know, I listen You're to like their that. music. I like that. I like a little commitment to social justice. I can mix enjoying myself mm-hmm. and to the music, but having the lyrics mean something a little more profound, right? Yeah, right. Having a message than, behind than it. Having a message of social change and social justice. Yeah. What are some of the other artists that are good with like social justice? You know, este, um, de este, what's his name? I'm sorry, I, I, I don't want to get putting this you on the spot. Sorry, I know you're putting me on. No, but he's really, he's really good. What do they call him? El Conejo. What do they call him? El bad, bad Bunny. Bad Bunny. Uh-huh. Now, Bad Bunny. Forgive me. I have yet to find a song I'm going to put on my lake house. Okay? I know, I know that you're making tens of millions of dollars. I know that you're filling the stadiums everywhere you go. Bad Bunny, when you see this. And yeah. just so that you know, Bad Bunny, don't hold me responsible. All the rest of the Gutierrez family has downloaded your stuff. There you okay? Go. Okay? So, they got to you know, put you on. They you got to remember. Song, yeah. They're the ones that buy your tickets, okay? <laughs> Wait a minute. They're Let me expensive. That. They are the ones who have daddy buy the four hundred and fifty yeah, dollars tickets, like, okay? okay? Yeah. To watch your concert. So just so you know, Bad Bunny, I have filled your coffers. Yes, sir. Through my yo, through my daughters and my you and yeah. my eighteen year old. I'm your, your grandson. And my grandson Luis, he knows all the lyrics to Bad Bunny song. But, but it's just yeah, 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 yeah. But, yeah <laughs> but you know what? But can I say one thing? One thing you have to say about Bad Bunny. One, the transsexual community in Puerto Rico was being attacked. Okay. He stood up for them. Right. When the governor of Puerto Rico went and called the president of Chicago of the New York City Council, right, and called her a puta, you know, this man stood up. He stood up for poor people. He stood up for the ravaging uh, uh, of the ravage uh, consequences of Hurricane Maria. And he came back and stopped the concert in Europe to come back to Puerto Rico to lead in demand that the governor of Puerto Rico resign. And you know something? La gente lo siguieron. Of course. La gente lo siguieron a él y este, and other artists. So they have a platform, yep. especially for the youth. Right. They have a platform. And let's face it, I just came back from Mexico City baptizing my son, and they celebrated International Day de la Mujer, El Día Internacional yeah. de la Mujer. You know what? I went to get something to eat, and I watched the woman walking back, mm-hmm. right? Uh, going back to get in their cars, get on the train. It was over. The, you know, the march and the rally was over. It was nothing but young Mexicanas. They were young. They were all young. And I go, ese es el futuro. 
And you know, that's the people that listen to Bad Bunny too, right? <laughs> yeah. And, pay, and have their daddy and mommy pay for the tickets <laughs> yeah, and they yeah, yeah, yeah. the concert. But my point is, they do have an influence, right. right? Of course. They could have a negative influence. They could have a positive influence. And in my case, I have to tell you that, um, that um, you know, Residente de Calle 13, you know, he has an influence, a positive one over our community. And I love when they sacrifice, make us, because he made a sacrifice. He took on the governor of Puerto Rico. 500,000 people showed up. Tu sabes, mi papá me decía a mí, you want to see somebody that's powerful? A ver si tienen el poder de convocatoria. Hmm? Hmm. See if they have the power to call upon people to meet. Right? De convocatoria. Well, guess what? He did. He's got he it. has the poder. <laughs> yeah. And then I went to the march. I told him, I was in Puerto Rico at the time. We're watching the news. And the governor says, well, I'm not going to resign, but I'm not going to run again. <laughs> and um, I resigned as the president of the party. And I looked at my wife, and she said to me, she said, He's gonna. I don't care who the president of his party is. I don't care if he runs again. That's not the point. He disqualified himself from being the governor today. Right now, yeah. Right? He can't stay there for two more years. Right. He's immoral. And I said, well, honey, I think we're going to have to get up like at four in the morning. She said, why? Because we're going to have to get up early to go to that march because there's going to be a lot of people there. And I think he just infuri- if he infuriated you. I think he just helped. I think everybody that watched us at Noticiero that maybe wasn't going to go because I shared with you your reaction. The next day, we didn't get at five in the morning. (laughs) But don't worry, we got there at seven. Yo sabía donde estacionar el carro. When when half a million people are going to show up, (laughs) you better know where to park your car. Okay? (laughs) It, 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 it's, it's a conglomeration well, of people. Well, with Toyota Corollas, you could just park it anywhere, <laughs> man. <laughs> no, that's... <laughs> no, 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 no. It was out there. No. She, she got an Audi. Yeah, oh. man. Oh. Out there. Yeah. Whoa. With the little beepers that go off if anybody gets too close to you. Oh, the Yo la, mira, no, no. Yo la cuido mucho. <laughs> I got her the car with all the safety stuff. Yeah. You know? And it's in Puerto Rico. So I got her the SUV. Yes. I said, that way when the little Toyota messes with her, we know who's going to win, right? <laughs> uh, we know who's going to win, the safety-conscious Germans or, or the little uh, Toyota from Japan. I think who's going to win that contest. But my point is, they do have a poder de convocatoria. I love when they use it because there is a risk right. to doing what they're right. doing, right? But guess what? He's more popular. Then he got to Puerto Rico, and he came to, uh, you know, this guy's Doing concerts all over the place, right? (laughs) And he stops and he comes back to the island. They said, well, why'd you come here for? Coming back to visit the island. Anything? You have a concert? They said, no, I came back to register to vote. (laughs) It's everybody's responsibility to vote. And they said, oh, what party are you going to vote for? I'm not going to tell you, but I'm going to tell you what. The status quo sucks. And I'm voting to end the status quo. I was like, whoa. Wow. Those means the parties that have been in power, right? Right. Kind of like, uh, you know, PRD y PRI in Mexico and Puerto Rico, Popular y Estadista, right? Those are the parties that have been in power. So guess what? Uh, the, the progressive leftist parties in Puerto Rico, the two parties combined got 29% of the vote, unprecedented. And I think that I'm not giving him total, res- you know, the candidates were good. The parties were excellent. They ran the campaign. But I think that, when you look at Bad Bunny, he's a reflection, right? Right. Of sentiments that may not be yours, of the youth, of a new generation. And it clicked to me that day when I saw the results, I said, okay, él echó su granito. Right. right. Right? But it was a good granito that helped take us to a place where now there's new legislator, legislators who really are going to deal with income inequality, nice. you know, in Puerto Rico. So which is such a big issue across the United States, across the world, yeah. right? Rich get richer and richer, richer, and more and more people yeah. con escasez, with less right. and less yeah. uh, trying to struggle to get through. That's pretty... Uh, I had just seen an interview with uh, Residente uh, about okay. that, actually, and uh, uh, I was very impressed by how many people he was able to organize. And I mean, half a million is, is a ton of people. It's a lot. Yeah. And I'm going to tell you, I was there, and I got there, I've been to a lot of protests in my life. And I told my wife, I said, honey, you know what the amazing thing about this is? She goes, there's a lot of people. I said, yeah, we don't know any of them. <laughs> right. Siempre son los mismos gatos y gatas que aparecen en la protesta. It's the same people, right? And the difference was 
it was young people. Mm -hmm. So I said, great, they're going to be around for 50, 60 years. And I think one of the things that I noticed in the last campaign, and I think this is around the world, this is not just occurring in Puerto Rico, is the youth is saying, you know, mom and dad, we're not really crazy about the world you left us. Right, right. We're not right. really crazy about the way in which society is organized that you left us. We know you you tried. Guess what? We want to do more fundamental change to our society. And so that's good to yeah. see them generationally come come forward. I I, uh, I seen uh, you were speaking at an event where you mentioned, um, you know, that your parents, uh, when they were returned to Puerto Rico, uh, there was a lot of, you know, talking and, and – uh, and I kind of like the way you worded it, where it was something along the lines of, um, you know, the the new generation, um, or you're here to speak out because they didn't speak out. So you, oh, yeah. So I think, I'm, you know, thank you. Yeah. Uh, so I have spoken to that in terms of me, right? Right. So I, so when my mom and dad showed up in Chicago in 1952, mm. there wasn't a banner like across State Street, right? And Randolph said, welcome, welcome. Puerto Ricans to Chicago. So happy to have you, right. right? Remember, 1952, it was still legal to discriminate. You know, separate but, you know, was the law of the land, right? There would not be a civil rights movement that changed that, right? It would begin in the 50s and flourish under the leadership of Martin Luther King, and we would get a civil rights act right. and a voting rights act. Right? In 64 and 65. But remember, when Roberto Clemente, the, one of the most iconic figures of Puerto Rico, on the Pittsburgh Pirates, right? Right. When he would travel with the Pittsburgh Pirates and go to the South, he couldn't stay with them at the same hotel because hmm. it was whites only. Yeah. He couldn't be on the same bus going, going to play a, a baseball game. He had to live separate. He had to travel separately from them. Why? Because Roberto Clemente, Puerto Rican, he's also black, right. right? And that's the picture. And when Martin Luther King came to Puerto Rico, he stayed at Roberto Clemente's house, right? A lot of people don't understand. People look at him as a baseball figure, right. right? He gave his life up going on an airplane to go to Managua, Nicaragua, because the corrupt Somoza regime was stealing everything that was being sent by the international community. So he said, no, yo me voy a montar bien a ver si a Roberto Clemente le quitan la comida, la ropa y la medicina que lleva el pueblo de Puerto Rico. Mm. You know, this was the MVP of the World Series. Right. And he gets on an airplane to go to Managua, Nicaragua, right. right? He didn't write a letter, right? He didn't do a fundraiser and a, and a telethon. Those things are all good. No, he got on the plane and said, <laughs> I have to take on a dictator. I have to take on his soldiers right roberto clemente is going to do that so my point is this when i talk about that i saw my parents i saw the discrimination i saw the prejudice i mean growing up puerto rican in chicago there's always one thing that's going to happen to you you're going to get into an argument with somebody and they're going to try to win it by saying this why don't you just go back where you came from i mean and i'm not saying that's an exclusive thing to puerto ricans but it Everybody happened to me. To all Latinos. It happens to me a lot. <laughs> right. So I used to so I internalized that. Cause when we grew up, it's not like today, right? Where where you know young Mexicanos and young Boricuas, they marry each other, right? Right. I mean, I come from a generation that stuff didn't happen, right? Yep. It was rare. My point is, so generation I everything I experienced, I experienced as a Puerto Rican. So I looked at all of that. I looked at the housing, I looked at the the swimming pools we couldn't go to, the parks we couldn't play in. I looked at the segregation of society, and I saw what my parents went through and the discrimination and racism and prejudice that they suffered. And what I said was, I saw it happen to them. I'm not going to allow it to happen to immigrants that come to the United States of America today. Lo que yo vi que le hicieron a mi mamá y mi papá, eso es inaceptable. Y yo no lo voy a permitir. I'm not going to allow that to happen again. Yeah. And so a lot of... People say, immigration, you know, you're a citizen. Puerto Ricans are citizens of the United States. Well, I said, because la misma man, the same thing that Donald Trump says, Mexicans are murderers, rapists, drug dealers, they're bad people, right? 
That's what they said about Puerto Ricans, that we were bringing right. tropical diseases. Yeah, yeah, that's what I... Right? Yeah. We were bringing tropical diseases, that all we wanted to do was come here and be on welfare, that we were lazy, that we were... I mean, all of these things they said about us. That's what they said about my mom and my dad. They were wrong about my mom and my dad, and they're wrong about the immigrants that come from Mexico, El Salvador, and all parts of America that that the, the, the current political um, um, uh, debate that we have in this country... Wants to wants to wants us to hate them. Wants right. us to feel. Pre- That's the same thing they wanted to feel against my mom and my dad. You know what? I remember my mom. Man, they worked hard every day. I remember my 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 mom ponía la radio, you know, at five in the morning because she had to be work at work by seven. And I used to remember en mi casa toman bustelo. I mean, they got that commercial because I heard it the first thing that every morning yeah. on the Puerto Rican radio. There was a little Puerto Rican radio station that had just enough power to get to my house. Right. And that's what my mom and my mom listened to first thing in the morning. So when I saw it happen, I said, not on my watch. Yeah. I've seen this movie before. Not I'm not going to allow it to happen again. So people ask me, oh, did you see West Side Story? There's a new version. I said, look, I didn't like the first version that much. Right. I know everybody's going to say, oh, but, you know, they got Academy Awards. And I said, no, no, no. When the Puerto Ricans are wearing the white gym shoes, okay, and we're the Jets, maybe I'll take a look. Right. Right? I'll take but I don't know why we got to have the black gym shoes, because every time I saw the people dressed in black, those are the bad guys. Yeah. The one dressed in white are usually the good guys. I'm sorry. That's just the way I look at these things. Right. And I think of... Yeah, and and I, I, I just go to myself. I said, "Wait a minute, now, let me see." Sharks, jets, hmm, jets, <laughs> right? I want to be a jet, fly, modern, yeah. right? Aviation. Uh, look, I look at the movies, and sometimes I look at them, and I say, "Wow, I had to live by that movie." Remember, this movie comes out in sixty two, sixty three. Okay, so I'm like ten years old. So a lot of people's point of reference that they have in terms of me being Puerto Rican. It's West Side Story. I said, mm-hmm. I'm tired. That, that does not explain who I am. It wasn't written by Puerto Ricans. <laughs> it wasn't directed, produced by Puerto Ricans. Yeah. So was, guess what? Was a bad uh, so I, I, you know, I'm happy that, 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 that Rita Moreno got her ability to, you know, to be there, a star. But so did a lot of other, uh, a lot of other, but it's just not my cup of tea. So it just c- depends on where you come from, right? Right. Yeah, I, I kind of wanted to bring that up because uh, right now that you touched on the whole um, the younger generation telling the parents, hey, we don't like the world that, you know, right. you left us, per se. Right. right. I also think it's a big, big factor that this young generation in kind of every aspect of life is um, a lot more fearless as well. I, and I think that they, I like uh, that. yeah, they, uh, back in the day, I can only imagine because I obviously wasn't there, but in my parents' day, everyone was just too scared. I, you also said, I don't know the uh, uh, um, talk or speech that, you know, people, immigrants are scared to call the police. They're scared to ask for help because of, you know, the the thought uh, or the, en todo lo que la palabra de ignorancia, pensar que they're going to get deported because they're going to call the police. And, um, and, and now it's obviously the, the new generation, uh, the third, the fourth generation now, you know, down the line is a lot more fearless. And, and I think that you look back, you just said, you know, these bands, for example, are from 1950s, 1960s. I mean, if we want to take it back to, like, um, humane parts. Like, 50 years ago, like you just said, you know, mm-hmm. Roberto Clemente couldn't travel with the team. Nope. And now we have these dreamers, and we have, you know, like, right. and, and for the people that probably didn't believe in such a movement, like, look at how many years, you know, it, t- it takes time. Yeah, and now uh, you, could pick, you could pick the all-star team. Right. Based on Latinos. I'm sure right. all the Dominicans are saying, Gutierrez, yes, remember, <laughs> we got some of the best players out there. But so do the Puerto Ricans, so mm-hmm. the Col- right? I mean, and you can see the reflection of so the young people. I like the word you used. They're 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 fearless. Yeah, that's good because that's what we need. Now, my mom and dad, they never knew what it meant to have a congressman, them, you know, with a last name like Gutierrez. Correct. Most people grew up. <clears throat> They never saw. They never saw Jesus Garcia. They never saw city council members. They never even had teachers, policemen, anybody in a position of authority that looked like them. That's beginning to change. Right. We need to change it even more. And our youth is fearless about that. I guess the. Let me think. So, my grandson, okay. Luis, who I, you can tell, we'll talk about him all night. Yeah. So, uh, Luisito, we call him Luisito. Luisito. You know, number one, Luisito, he's la raza cosmica. Why? 
His dad's from Iguala, you know, Mexico, right? And his mom, super Puerto Rican with the curly hair, the whole thing, right? My daughter, Omaira, my <laughs> oldest. And so that's Luisito, right? He can say, um, ay bendito and orale, like nothing, right? like nothing. He uses both expressions. He knows how to say ahorita and for it to mean now or in a little while, <laughs> right? <laughs> right now or in a little while. You know, he... But, but, you know, he, he can eat a rock con gandule y tomarse su pozole. Like nothing. He likes it all. Why? Because that's how he grew up. Right. He grew up on being proud, right, of the Puerto Rican traditions of, 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 of his, you know, his, his, one of his sets of his grandparents and the Mexican traditions of the other. And so he's la raza cosmica, right? He's the best. He's a, a fusion. Of, of, but he's even more than that because think about him. Um, when he's like in fifth grade, sixth grade, they have a birthday party. It was like, I remember it was a beautiful birthday party. And all the parents show up. And there was a little girl, Margarita. And Margarita comes in with her two dads, right? And I'm sitting back there and I'm watching this. I want to see this, right? Mm -hmm. Nothing. It was seamless. All the parents grabbing everybody. Bro, in my fifth, my fifth grade, yeah. If Margarita would have showed up with two dads, that, a, you know it, yeah. it, it just didn't point. happen. Yeah. But I like it. That's normal as it should have been when I was in fifth grade. Right. Today, we've changed. We've progressed. We've moved on. Right. We're more accepting. That's the world that that 18-year-old says. So now when you have, don't say I'm gay laws in Florida... And in Texas, right. you can't say it. I mean, basically, they don't want to talk about it, right? Wow, Luisito looks at that and he says, that's not right, right? right? Because an immigrant, I'll just tell you, Barack Obama came to Chicago to announce a program where under an executive order, every immigrant in the United States who had American citizen children, they're undocumented, no tienen papeles, right? They're undocumented. But if you have American citizen children, I'm going to give you a work permit. Right. Let you work, and I'm not going to separate you from those children because if I deport you, what happens to the American citizen children? Okay. Right. Had a good program. So we went to it. So me, my daughter Jessica, my daughter, I've always taken them to go to the White House and see them. They got pictures with the president, you know, Clinton. They got pictures, right, or Barack Obama. Um not so many with George Bush, although he was okay. I mean, we got along. The Iraq war was a terrible mistake. Yeah. Right. A terrible mistake. But on other issues, we worked on other issues together. Um, my point is, I take Luisito. And Barack Obama and I didn't exactly have a, a how would I say, a warm, personal relationship. Uh, you didn't call him Barry. <laughs> no, I didn't call him Barry. I mean, he, he comes in with a promise for immigration reform and winds up deporting more people than any that, president that ever of the yeah. United States. So, you know, we have, I'm getting arrested, I'm denouncing his administration, then he does he does DACA for the Dreamers before he runs for re-election. We're, we're seeing hope, and he does change. Okay. Just so that you know, we challenged him, but he changed, he listened which speaks to his humanity, right? That he can hear a criticism and say, wow, okay, I don't like it. What politician like a bunch of people getting arrested outside their office, their right, home, right. in this case, the White House, and being denounced? Remember, we called them deporter in chief. Yep. Yet at the end, he began doing a lot of very progressive, humane things when it came to immigrants. Having said that, I take Lucito to the event because it's going to be full. And I want Lucito to experience and see power firsthand, raw. What more raw can you be than the yeah, president of right. the United States? But you know, he was very kind. He, he saw him, he said, he says, little man, so what's your name? And he says, Luis Figueroa. Oh, and who are you here with? I'm here with my grandpa. He could call me abuelo, grandpa, whatever he wants. I love that kid. You know, <laughs> and he says it in English, Spanish, however he wants to do it. What, whatever, whatever he wants to say, it means love. And and he said, he says, oh, so so why did you come? And Luisito says, because now I have tias and tios that won't be deported. I mean, think about that a moment. 
a kid that's in like sixth grade saying to the president of the United States, I came here because now I have aunts and uncles My who family. won't be deported. Mm. I mean, this is the grandson of a prominent member of Congress, right? Been there over 20 years. He's my grandson. And yet in our family, because Luisito's family is my family, we have tias and tios that can be deported. That's how mixed we are between those that have and those that don't. Those that have to fear the migra and those that don't. We're really all intermeshed. We are all one community. And my grandson basically told the president of the United States that, yeah, yo soy, este es mi abuelo, but yo tengo tía y tía that they don't have the same credentials, right, to stay here in this country as my grandpa does. And I came here to celebrate that fact with you. So, like you said, they're fearless. They're learning, yeah. right? They're learning. They're going to be different. Look, if you were in Chicago in the 80s, I remember when people used to call Mexicanos wetbacks. I remember. And it it was like, it wasn't like people would go, oh, wh- wh- why'd you say that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it was to, It was like people would out. say that. It was another household name, but they upgraded to Beaners now. So Okay, <laughs> so they, so, but you get my point. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. But today, people have raised a level of consciousness and awareness. Que esa es su familia. Y de ahí tú vienes. Right. Right? Y ahí tú pudiste haber estado. So, that kind of unity that exists. So when I run for Congress, Puerto Ricans, Mexicans, Salvadorians, Ecuadorians, Colum- doesn't matter, right? They're all supporting. But better yet, think about it. At any time, 35 to 40% of the voters that elected me to Congress were not Hispanic. They were white. Yet they voted for me in overwhelming numbers time and time again. Mm. You don't think they saw the same <clears throat> episodes on the, the nightly news? That the Latinos saw, they watched it on Univision and Telemundo, <laughs> right? Right? They watched it on ABC and NBC, CNN, whatever. They watched it, but now they're allies. Now they're friends, right? Because they see that Luis Gutierrez is a for LGBTQ rights, right? B for women's rights, right? Like my like my chief of staff used to say, "I love my boss. I'm a woman, but he pays me like I'm a man." Nice, right? Nice. Uh, <laughs> why? Because in the Congress of the United States, you could see the difference between men that are chief of staff and women that are chief of staff. And we see that permeate throughout our society. They see that I'm I'm an environmentalist, right? Mm. They see that I want workers' rights. They go, wow, we can't pigeonhole Luis Gutierrez. They see the kind of intersectionality. They see that I go to the airport to say, let the Muslims in when there's a Muslim ban, right? So we're part of a greater movement. So I don't go to... Trump's inauguration, right? I don't go. But I was in Washington, D.C. The, the day he got, I don't know why, I had to get there so I could go to sleep to go to the Women's March the next day. <laughs> oh. One million people showed up yeah. at nice. the Women's March. It was one of the most beautiful experiences that I had. I mean, I still had a little trouble because my wife wanted one of the pink hats. <laughs> okay. And I didn't know what. Remember, I'm living in Puerto Rico, yeah. so we're kind of showing up. I'm not quite up to speed on right. everything. So I walk up to this woman and I say, excuse me, my wife wants to know where she can where she buy can one of the uh, the pink hats. She goes, you mean one of the pussy hats? <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> I'm looking at her like, <laughs> okay. Well, that's sure. what they. Is that what it's called? That's what, I'm like. <laughs> Yes, that's what she yeah. wants. And I tell my wife, says, that's exactly what I want. <laughs> I bought her one, you know? I said, okay. But my point is this. We're all learning. Yeah. We're all growing. Everything, right? Everything keeps moving, dead. man. Yeah, every day, every day we're growing. Every day we're, I'm happy I'm at the Women's March, you know? And, 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 and that we're there and that that's America's response. But guess what? At the Women's March. You saw the signs for immigration reform at the Women's yeah. March. Mm. It wasn't the Women's March wasn't the exclu- it was intersectionality, mm. right? It was Black Lives Matter. It was the Muslims. It was the immigrants. It was the environmentalists. It was the labor union leaders, right? right. It was all of us together. I remember LGBTQ signs all over the fa- and flags, right? All intermeshed in a movement led by women right. mm-hmm. and. We- I'm just, I know, th- I know there's three men, right? There's three boys sitting around right? the table. But women are going to change and transform the no, world. I Mark my a thousand words. percent agree with you. 
Um, you brought up the whole Obama. Uh, I wanted to touch two points that I caught there that um, I really appreciate because uh, I, I got to give you mad props because uh, and mad respect because in, in the whole uh, politic world, uh, I'm not huge on it, um, but I'm huge on you because uh, you're big on accountability, and I think that's super important. And I think that's something that's very shady in, in the uh, uh, political world, political per se. World. Yeah. And, and, and I like the fact that you call out Obama, you know, that you call out um, Trump. Uh, there's always an accountability. Biden. Yeah. How hard is that for you, though? Like, yeah. in your celebrity... Because, you know, I, I mean, you're one of the few that figure, calls them out. Stati- yeah. You know, again, I felt I had that, res- that that was a responsibility. Yeah. I looked. I know what it's like. So when I'm 15, my mom and dad, remember, back in the 60s, bro, your parents didn't have a conversation when shit was going to change, right? Correct. They didn't like tell you, what do you think about this? And try, <laughs> and try to figure out your sensibilities. It was like, one day you were living in Chicago, the next day they had the Chevy Impala, the French provincial furniture, that lamp with the three lights that came out that hit the ceiling, and they bought all that stuff, and they were packing to go back to Puerto Rico, yeah, right. right? And I didn't know that we were getting the new furniture and the car and all the new <laughs> stuff because we could ship it back. Because my mom and dad, they, I know now, they wanted to return after 15 hard years of working back to their home. Yeah. You know, in Mi Viejo San Juan, <laughs> if people would listen to that song, it's a song de añoranza. It's a song about pain yeah. that I have to leave. Mi pueblo querido, ¿verdad? mi isla amada. I mean, listen to the lyrics of that song. There's a reason that song is so prominent in the lives. Yeah. And you know, Every mariachi worth their respect in Mexico knows the lyrics to Mi Viejo San Juan, okay? Yeah. It's a universal song because it speaks to Mexicans and their immigration mm-hmm. and leaving home behind. It's it, Look, it can speak to anybody that's had to leave something behind in order to buscar algo, un futuro mejor. mejor. ¿Verdad? Un sueño mejor que no tenían en su propio país. Which was fearless in itself to right. leave your country in that to, aspect. They, can I tell you? Yeah. Yes. I told my dad, I said, Dad, I said, could you speak English one? He goes, no. Mm-hmm. I, I said, well, like, how did you learn? He said, I listened. Yeah. And, you know, I, I used to order cheeseburger every day because I knew those words. Right. I said, so, so how'd you get out of that? He said, well, I, I learned these other words. I said, what is it? The same thing. I said, the same thing? How, why'd you learn the same thing? Because I would look at what other people ordered, and I'd <laughs> like it, and i said, say, I want the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> and so... Look, they survived, yeah. right? And in the end, my dad spoke English. He was a cab driver, right? Mi mamá se quedaba con la comadre mucho más, right? I mean, you know, bautismo, boda, quinceañeras, right? right? She was, her English was, was on the weaker side. But my dad, being a man, you know, getting out, his English was better. Anyways, one day, he just says, we're moving to Puerto Rico. I'm like going, okay. I got my little Young Lord's button. Right, because I'm from Lincoln Park. Okay, okay. Young Lords were on Armitage and Halstead back in the day. Not today. They couldn't afford to start an organization <laughs> like, like Ar- that. Armitage and Halstead. Yeah, no, well. you can't, no, no, no. You can't do. You can't do that there. <laughs> and I remember having my little bo- botón que decía, "Yo tengo Puerto Rico en mi corazón" with a puño, hmm. right? And um, and the purple berets. And I remember them walking around the neighborhood. And my dad was like, "Stay away from them." Those are radicals. And the more he said it, the more I was intrigued by who they were. Yeah. Never tell a 15-year-old, <laughs> you, know, no, you don't, wanna, do don't go. <laughs> He's going. Yeah. Okay? So, so he tells me we're going to Puerto Rico, and I'm like, cool. Long story short, the plane lands. Because, of course, the men have to be the people, the advance team. Right? So my father and I, we have to go there, make sure the furniture arrives, Get the apartment. Clear you know, the way. Clear get, the way. <laughs> clear the way. You know, we're living with the aunt, his brothers and sisters, blah, 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 right? Uh, so that when mom and my sister get there, cuando las mujeres llegan, está los muebles listo. están, and, you know, <laughs> everything's ready, right? So the men are the first ones going forward. I remember getting out the plane. Look, it's hot in Chicago. I get that. But this is not tropical heat. Remember, we show up in July, mm. okay? <laughs> it's hot in Puerto Rico in July, okay? Yeah. It's hot here, but it's a lot hotter there. Oh, it's tropical heat. So I get off and I go, Dad, I say to him in English, we've been speaking bilingual. 
He speaks to me in Spanish. I speak to him in English. We're getting along for 15 years just fine, right? He understands me. I understand him. We're good. <laughs> he never told me, aprenda español, right? He never right. told me any of that. You know, mira. So we get there, and I said, mira, papi, can, I have, can, can you buy me a Coca-Cola? I say to him in English. And he turns around, and he says, mijo, hable español. Estamos en Puerto Rico. La gente se van a creer que somos come mierda. Now, I'm like going, come mierda. I never heard him say that word before. But it's a pretty easy translation. Eat shit, right? Right, right, right. Uh, okay, <laughs> they were shit eaters if we speak <laughs> English. English. Another, we think we're better than they are. Right. Oh, right? Okay. We're not respectful of their culture, their traditions. And, Eres and Norteñito. We've come here. I think right? you had mentioned that, right? What's that? Say it. No, Eres Norteñito. Yeah. So, yeah. Esos son americanos, gringos que vienen de allá. Okay. So I get it. Of course, you know, we didn't say these things to our parents. Today, kids tell their parents all kind of shit. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Uh, they do. You know, they don't like, oh, why you? When I, I just held it inside. When, I mean, you could have told me. You, you've been talking about coming to this place for 15 years. You never told me I had to, like, yeah, pick up on up, my. up, man. Yeah. So I go to school. I register. And, again, they just send you to school. My parents, they didn't think, they said, mira, vete a la escuela, you've been going to school for nine Ahí years. Está. Ahí está la escuela, vete. <laughs> so I went with my terrible Spanish. Oh, now remember, this is San Sebastián del Papino, so en el campo, right? So, so They're good. cutting sugar cane and picking coffee. Those are the, those are the major great. industries, agriculture. I come from Chicago, from the streets <laughs> of Chicago, right? <laughs> coffee, sugar cane, mm, yeah. I don't understand that. It's hard work. It's backbreaking work. It's under the sun, and they're doing it. Right. And um, so I get there. I go to the school, and I, I go to my homeroom. And my professor was El Profesor Hernández. I remember mm. lo de Hernández because la H muda en español. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Because the first time I said Hernández. Hernández. Y las muchachas son hermosas. You know, and, they, and everybody started laughing at me. So anyways, he sends me home. You know what the, the in, my history teacher asked me, bro? He says, mira, llenaste esto. You know, the homeroom card where you put your name and your address and yeah. stuff. It, it, it says, madre. And I said, I didn't understand what he was talking about. Tú no tienes madre. Don't you have a mother? And I thought he was bad-mouthing my mom because my Spanish is weak now, so I'm not You're not actually fully catch, understanding everything. I'm not fully yeah. understanding everything. So then I'm like going, tú no tienes, don't you have a mother? He says, and he tells me in Spanish, he says, I don't know how things are like in the United States, but here, if you're going to be a sophomore in high school, you need to at least know your complete name. Mm. When you know your complete name, you come back. And he threw me, he, he sent me home. That now, same day you just let, the same day I got there. Wow. And I'm like, I got kicked out of school. I ain't done nothing wrong. <laughs> They're sending me home. I went back home crying, man. Yeah. I'm a I'm, I'm this, you know, 15 going on 16 year old kid, and this teacher's treated me with this hostility, right? So I go home and I tell my mom, Mom, que si yo no tengo madre, now my mother, she's, she, she gets it right away. No, es que antes yo casarme con tu papá, my name was Adamina Olmedo, right? That's her maiden name. Maiden name and in yeah. Puerto Rico, being a Latin American country, yes, ladies and gentlemen of the world listening to this podcast, we're all American citizens, but we're part of Latin America. Right. Okay. Just go visit the island and turn on the radio <laughs> or try to buy a newspaper <laughs> or watch the local news. Or wait a minute, go to the state legislature and see what language the governor and the state legislature say. Spanish. Yeah. So I go home and you know, that's when I learned my name. Luis Vicente Gutierrez. Olmedo, Luis Vicente Gutierrez. And I said it in front of the mirror. I'm like saying, oh, man, now I'm Puerto Rican. Were you like in shock at first? Like, oh. Oh, when she told me my name, right. I thought it was marvelous. Okay, Thank you okay. for asking. Yeah. I was. I was like, I have this badass name, and it took all these years for somebody <laughs> like, to tell me? Yeah. I was Gutierrez, Gutierrez, Gutierrez. I mean, I had my name pronounced differently every time I every had a year. new. Every, every year. Every school year. Yeah. Every school year was pronounced. I was cool. Yeah. I, I adapted, right? But now I learned this, Luis Vicente Gutierrez Olmedo. And I, I used to say, I said to myself, Luis Vicente Gutierrez Olmedo, gobernador, mm. presidente. Luis Vicente Gutierrez Olmedo, you know, I used to, you added doctor, the, yeah. doctor cirujano, right? I'd add like something to it. Right. Anyways, 
I thought I had Puerto Ricanized myself. I said, okay, I, I got this. Yep. I went the next day. There was a pretty girl in the corner, my homeroom, classroom. I knew how to fill the thing out. So I walked <laughs> up to her. And I said in the most impeccable Spanish, right? I said, hola. Mi nombre es Luis Vicente Gutierrez Olmedo. I was so proud of myself. <laughs> and I said, ¿y cómo tú te llamas? And what's your name? Right? Right. She goes like this frantically, raising her hand. Mr. Mr. That's what they call the teachers. Okay. Mr. 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 Sí, señorita. El gringo me está molestando. Ah. I'm like, oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I learned my name. <laughs> Yesterday I was I couldn't be here because I didn't know, I know my name. Like I just gave you my full I just, name. I just gave you my full name and I pronounced it beautifully. I right. know I did this right. Everybody laughed in the classroom, right? Look, so when you ask me about taking on a president of the United States or somebody in power, right? I think of that moment in my life. Hmm. I think how I wanted the earth to. You know, we've all had these experiences, right? Escúpeme, me. Drágame tierra. I just, I just, Gracias. Yeah. That's what you, you want the earth to just <laughs> tragarte, mm -hmm. right? You want to disappear. You feel so humiliated, so alone, right. right? So alienated from everything around. No friends, no support, right? Yeah, yeah, Human yeah. beings, that's not how we are built, right? To be ridiculed and demeaned and outcast right. in front of all the rest of your classmates. And you know what? I see the Mexicano that arrives in Chicago. Isn't he just like me? Maybe his English isn't that good. That's a great right? analogy. Maybe, maybe he doesn't dress, you know, as hip and as cool as everybody else. Correct. You know, maybe he's just like me. And there are people ridiculing him and using him as an instrument, as Trump did, right? Correct. Uh, for political gain, calling him all these things and making him outcast, making him un unwelcome. I said, no, 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 no. In my life, if I'm going to do something, I'm going to make people welcome, especially those that are new, those that, that didn't grow up and have the same experience, those that maybe don't fit in. Correct. Like, I didn't fit in, right? Because, you know, in the end, in Mano, I got to tell you something. As sad as that story is, there was Puerto Ricans who taught me how to speak Spanish, man. Mm -hmm. Right? There was some... They became my friends. Yeah, there's always someone there that wants to help you that out, That wants right? to help you. I want to be like the ones that wanted to help me. Right. Right? The ones that helped, because they helped me grow. They helped make who I am today. Yeah. So a lot of times my dad told me, you know, oh, you're always complaining that I brought you to Puerto Rico, that, you know, none of the girls liked you. And <laughs> it's true. Uh, <laughs> you know, you couldn't, buy, you know, blah, blah. You didn't have your old friends. You had nobody to hang out with, that everybody treated you badly. And then he ended my dad with his wisdom. He says, Pero te hizo quien eres. Right. But it made you who you are today. Imagine if you didn't take that trip. If I hadn't. Over, right, yeah. If I hadn't had that experience, I think my experience would have, my life would have unfolded so much differently. So when I see somebody treating a newcomer as I was, remember, I was a foreigner in my own land, Papa. Yeah, yeah. In my own country. I was called a spick and referred to as Puerto Rican for 15 years in the city of Chicago. I mean, nunca me dieron americanito. Right. Nobody called me a gringo in Chicago. Yeah. They called me Puerto Rican, you know, and they would confuse me, right, with other Mexican nationalities. And you know all the other words they would use, right? right. But from spick on down. And then finally I'm here, right, in Boricua, in yeah. my homeland, Mother, yeah. the, motherland, the motherland. And they're telling me that I'm not one of them. Yeah. So... To me, it was, uh, it was an important time, I think, in my life. So to take on power with all of the privilege that I have, I mean, being a member of Congress, think about that. Right. right? You get to be one of 435 members of the House of Representatives. Yep. One of 535 members of Congress. The what Senate are the odds the of House. that, right? Wow. Yeah. And you got there? And then what did you do with it? What did you do with it? So to me, I was in this very privileged place. Plus, let's be clear. When I come back to Chicago, everywhere I went, what did the people tell me? Sigue, lo está haciendo bien. You're doing it right. We're proud of you. So when I would come home, all I would receive is what? Love. Love. Yep. And they would say, Keep, stay strong. Keep. So I said, okay. 
Let, I, you know, it's good. So a lot of what I did was thank God to the community I represented. Because guess what? Every two years, I just get more votes. Right. Right. So obviously, I was doing something different, something good. I remember there was this Marty Castro, his lawyer, a Mexicano. Hmm. He was a little younger than me. He ran against me in 2002. So, you know, he, he put his boots on and his, you know, sombrero. He says, so mexicanísimo, right? And, you know, he's going to run against me. And I go on a radio station. I think it was La Mexicana. I think it was La Mexicana. Back then, yeah. I went on the Mexicana. I go on the radio station. And they open it up to the listeners, right? And I still remember that Mexican lady calling on. Yo no sé lo que le pasa a ese Marty Castro, que tú has sido bueno con nosotros. Me avergüenzo que un mexicano se atreva a quitarte el puesto. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like, Marty, I hope you're listening. Yeah. <laughs> you know, to the people back no, he was in the neighborhood. In yeah, yeah, he was listening to something else. <laughs> so, so, so his brand of politics was to say I was wrong, right? right. Even though he was mexicano, he was wrong. Bro. I wish we could just go to the Board of Elections to 2002 so that you could see how La Vigita yeah. Yeah. And, and Pilsen and Back of the Yards and Cicero right. voted for me. I mean, that is such incredible progress for us as a community, right? Uh, that we're, we're intermeshed. Okay. We're united. Right. We're together. So that for the, at least the last 10 years, the majority of Latinos that voted for me were Mexicanos. What was, uh, what, what's the recipe? Or, or que era la receta de, uh, it, it's just like in, in politics, mucha de la gente, like we, we had talked a bit about this when you just got here off, yeah. the, off the camera there where, where people can't relate, you don't relate or it, it's people. So what was the formula para ti, para, to, to relate to the community? Uh, not just the community, your your, your Puerto Rican background, mm -hmm. but uh, a la raza mexicana, a los hondureños, a los guatemaltecos. Right. Uh, right. What's the recipe, or, or how did you interconnect with them? Look, I always felt that I was doing what was right, right. and was speaking to my inner core, right? So I remember in 94 and 95, you could walk into a Puerto Rican restaurant on Division Street, right? <laughs> right. And they put me up on the news and... You could hear the Puerto Rican woman. Ese siempre es lo único que hace para ayudar a los mexicanos. ¿Cuándo va a hacer algo para los boricuas? Right? When am I going to do something for Puerto yeah. Ricans? And I'm like, That's not I true. am Puerto Rican. Yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. I get to be a member of Congress. Yeah. Right? Uh, don't you get that? Um, <laughs> no, they, they, that wasn't enough. They wanted... So you had that. Right. Conversely, you had some love coming. But in the end, we were all together. Look, when I did campaign for immigration reform and took on Barack Obama. Yeah. They were Puerto Rican evangelical ministers, right? With me on my side, standing up for the undocumented, right? The Cardinal of Chicago, we, we convened them in a church and the Cardinal of Chicago came and he told me I couldn't share the altar with them. He said, no, you can't be on the altar with me, Gutierrez. Uh, you get to but, steal my spotlight. Yeah. And then and he got up there, but his words were profound. Mm -hmm. He said that the immigrant, this is the cardinal of the Catholic Church of Chicago, to a president who just came from Chicago, right? Who's elected Barack Obama. He says, right. Your policies are immoral on immigration. Wow. You know, that's what you use power for. So I, I didn't, it wasn't just me. I tried to use my position, my power, my influence to see how we could make it bigger, the leadership right. for our community bigger because I knew it wasn't just me. So there's a video, John Lewis saying to me, and Gutierrez, whenever you want to make good trouble, you just call me. I'm ready. I will get arrested with you. So look, you have figures, historical figures from the civil rights movement saying to you, right? I want to... I'm down Just, with do you. you. I, I don't know. It gets easier, right? Right. That because makes you're sense. receiving so much support. I did, a, a, you could call it a crusade. I, I did journeys across this country, right, to San Francisco. I still remember San Francisco. Uh, Pelosi was the speaker. Okay. And she still is today. She's yes, been she around is. for a while, right? Good lady. So as Pelosi's the speaker, yes, we're at this beautiful Catholic church in San Francisco. 
Now, this has been organized by the immigrant groups of San Francisco. Okay. So she's the congresswoman. So they got to They're gonna invite her. This is her district that she represents in Congress, right? Um, so they're very nice. They introduce her. They give her up. They applaud. They're very nice. They're very gracious. Y yo, ay que bien que la respetaron, muy bien. And then they come and they said, and now we have our featured speaker, right? Our guest speaker from Chicago, Congressman Luis Gutierrez. It was a standing ovation. Hmm. I mean. Everybody got out of their seats, stood up, and clapped, and like they wouldn't stop. Now, I never let it go to my head. I knew what they were doing, right? Yeah, they were saying thank you to me, but they were also sending a message to the Speaker of the House. Right. We're going to applaud you. You're okay, but that's our that's boy. Good. That's <laughs> Okay? Yeah. And we got his back, right. right? And we're showing that to you. We're being respectful to you, but look how we received him. We receive him as our leader when it comes to immigration. You know, what an honor, what a privilege to be able to go to San Francisco, to Denver, um, to Birmingham, Alabama. Right. And, you know, I spoke <clears throat> from the same churches mm -hmm. that Martin Luther King spoke on civil rights about immigrant rights in, in Atlanta. Because guess what? Our immigrant community, it's everywhere. Right. Yeah, bro. Yeah. And it's Latinos just... were everywhere. You go to Charlotte. Tú te crees que tú estás como tú dices en Guadalajara en some places in Charlotte. You go, really, Charlotte, North Carolina? Yeah, go to Georgia. Go to Alabama. Go to Mississippi. Who do you think is doing the work, that hard, back-breaking work? There you go. Right? right? Yeah. There. Son mexicanos, son sí. latinos, son inmigrantes que vienen ahí at the meatpacking plants. That's one of the things during COVID-19 they used to, like CNN would have this, Oh, well, uh, the meatpacking plants, it's really spreading very quickly because right. they all have to be in very tight, you know, situations with one another. Yeah. It's really tragic. And I heard from one of the workers the following. And I'm like, Pendel, put him on the TV. Show them he's one of us. Right. Yeah. Show the world who they, – they sanitized him. They never told you that his last name was Gonzalez Rodriguez. They never told you his story. So how do you expect America to change their opinions about who it. they are yeah. if on the one hand you have a president calling us murderers, rapists, and drug dealers, and you have CNN and MSNBC not telling people not who we are? we are? I mean, that's part of what we need to do. I mean, I put on CNN and MSNBC, I put them on, right? Okay, because they're, okay, they're the liberal, progressive, good guys, right? Okay, put them on from 6 to midnight. Tell me that they have one Latino anchor Not for yet. six hours. Not yet. Not MSNBC is the same way. Yeah. You meet, watch Meet the Press, Face the Nation, George Stephan. They talk about immigration. Like, <laughs> there was like two white women, a white guy, and a black dude talking about immigration on right. Meet the Press last Sunday. And I'm like going, you couldn't find anybody? Like, during COVID-19, I said, you couldn't find, like, a doctor, a Latino doctor, to explain to us about COVID? I mean, this was an opportunity. Right. To bring a professor, a Latino, a Latino doctor, a Latino engineer, you know, to show the world, yes, we do pick your grapes. You know what? We also heal your people, mm -hmm. right. right? We also build your roads. We also design your buildings, right? We are a very important part of your economy. We're all of these people. But in America... The news media does not help us. Yeah. I told you before we came here, I watched ABC, CBS, NBC. I watched them all, 6 o'clock news. Not one Latino anchor. Really? In a city where more than, look, <laughs> more than one out of every three people in Chicago is Latino. Right. How are you going to have the news class in, newscast in the evening not be a reflection of the people you're telling them? Yeah. How do you expect them to tell our story? Oh, well, they got Univision and Telemundo. They got and Univision Telemundo. and Telemundo. Right. I said, thank God that we have them. <laughs> But we need to penetrate. Look, today, most Latinos receive their information in English, right. not in Spanish. Most Latinos receive it in English. But they can't, you can't be receiving the information, right, if you ain't getting it. One of the, I mean, the news media, when I, after Hurricane Maria, yeah. every time I would go taking stuff back from Chicago, the generosity of Chicago, I made several trips mm -hmm. uh, to take back stuff. In one, in one case, they said, Gutierrez, how are you going to spend that $125,000? I said, it's really simple. I said, I called the people from Walmart. 
out in Arkansas. I don't exactly get along with Walmart because I don't like the way they treat their employees. But guess what? I called them up and I said, I have $125,000. I expect to go to Sam's Club in Puerto Rico. And I expect for you to have $125,000 worth of rice, worth of beans, worth of wipes, worth of Infamil, worth of baby pampers. I mean, you yeah. na- I, I even the got the insurers because I know the viejito, even though I'm going to be 69, <laughs> sure, yeah. I still re- I don't do the insure thing yet, right? Yeah. <laughs> I, know the, I know the viejitos like the insure, right? So, bro, I got there. Then I talked to my Puerto Rican brothers and sisters. They got the two trailers. Bro, we distributed it. I used my power and my influence, you might say, in a good way. Yeah, I called a favor in so that people could be fed because the president of the United States had turned his back on them. Right. Right? So we had to take measures into our own hands, right, to alleviate the suffering of my own people. And guess what? Mexicans are murderers, rapists, right, and drug dealers, according to Donald Trump when he started his campaign, Mm -hmm. right? And everybody said, well, he didn't say that about me. I'm not Mexican, right? Right? I'm Colombian, or I'm Cuban, or I'm Puerto Rican. Well, guess what? Tell me the difference between how Donald Trump treated the people of Puerto Rico who are all citizens of the United States and the Mexicanos in the United States. When it came to a moment of need, there was no difference. Porque cuando él dice Mexicano, he means Latino. All of us, yeah. He means all of us, yep. right? It's like, you know, like my Boricuas, they get a little lazy, right? <coughs> so if you're from Vietnam, or you're from China, or you're from South Korea, or you're from Cambodia, ¿qué te dicen? Esos son chino, right? <laughs> right? It's like <laughs> one generic <laughs> term. I'm like, no, I think uh, they're not all Chinese. Yeah. You ever been yeah. called a Mexican? Yeah, but you know what? Yo lo, yo lo, yo, ay, perdone que no te puedo aceptar. <laughs> I can't do that. I would love to do it. Wow. There was this man. He was really tall. He grabbed, he says, Orale Gutierrez. And he grabbed my hand. Te quiero felicitar. I want to congratulate you. Marvelous work you're doing in Congress. Y sabes algo? Tu español ha mejorado muchísimo. And he keeps shaking my hand. And I'm like, okay. I said, I'm about to lose circulation in the head. Yes. But, but he's all, I'm like, yes. I mean, you know, a good politician. Yeah, yes. And, but then he said that my Spanish had improved. So, of course, I said, well, I've been practicing, right? Yeah. I'm happy somebody noticed. You know what he told me? He said, ¿sabes por qué? Porque hablas más y más como un mexicano. Mm. I was like, I went home. I told my wife. I said, I received this great gift. This man clearly with his boots and his hat. And, you know, being so proud of being Mexicano, he conferred upon me his nationality. He <laughs> conferred upon me who he is. He, he related said, to I, you, right? Yeah. Because yeah. yeah. why? Because he said, you speak for me, you speak to me. Nice. You know, you might as well be beat my Mexican. brother. Yeah. Yeah. Right. You might as well. And in some ways, we do kind of share the same DNA. Okay? It's kind <laughs> of the same, same, same kind of I process tamo. of colonization. I hay algo. But pero la gente no quiere distinguir. So I love the Mexican Independence Day prayer. I know you guys love coming out to the festivals, the Boricua Fest. Que bien, right? And I used, to, I used to say, you know what? If there has been, the Puerto Ricans really, really, really promoted that Puerto Rican flag so much, you know, when we had our festivals. I just think one day all the Mexicanos said, you know, really? Do you have to, like, take them down 26th Street yeah. and 18th and 47th and Ashland? You know, it was okay when you had them, you know, out in Humble Park. So I said, okay, next September, we're going to show you flags. flags. <laughs> now you go to Hold the north beer. side. You go to the north side. <laughs> que viva por Mexico. <laughs> y la viva la independencia. My point is, we become intermeshed geographically, right? And as you know, my daughter, my, both of my daughters are married to Mexicanos. Uh-huh. So I have two nietos, raza cosmica. And I'm very, how would I say, humbled that my first grandson, right? is um, named Luis, right? And my second grandson is named Luis, Luis are David. They, are, they, are they both from uh, are your, uh, yeah, your son-in-law? They're both from Iguala. They're oh, both from wow. Guerrero? Yeah. <laughs> what a small world. <laughs> right. We're like two Puerto Rican women married, two Mexicanos from the same es little town. Les gustan negritos de, de Guerrero. <laughs> 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 hey, but you, you, you've been to Guerrero? Or, so or, I, you, I'm gonna, you've so been to Mexico? I'm happy. I have been to Mexico. Uh-huh. I've been to Chiapas. Damn. Right? One day, when the revolutionaries... Isn't that where uh, the, the coffee's coming from? <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Yes. Right. Look, no, it's, the, it's 
Because in la montaña. Right, yeah. right. When you see, you remember those 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 fake commercials about coffee with, with Don Valdez yeah. and the horse in That's white? That's what I was telling you. It, it was a donkey. It was a donkey. I said, I said that shit ain't right. <laughs> But that's what we were talking about. Yeah, once yeah, once, we he talk, about once they were telling me about if, the coffee, if, I'm like, it's Senor Valdez. Yeah, big ass mustache yeah, with his the mustache and, <laughs> and, and, some, and a the horse. And then he had his little cup all of coffee. Clean. I said, no, 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 no. I've seen people pick coffee. <laughs> right. There is wow. no way. No way. That clean. There are bees and insects. It's oh, wow. under one of the things that makes the coffee from Chiapas and Puerto Rico special coffee is that. It's not in the blazing sun. And in the commercial, uh, they make you look at the mountains yeah. like they're growing coffee with the sun just hitting it. When we both know that some yeah, of the most the delicious way. coffee is because they have huge trees, right? Okay. And, 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 you know, the, 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 the stalks of the banana and, and the, the, you know, trees, right? Covering and giving them the shade. shade. Yeah. So my, my, I guess my point is, yeah. So both of my daughters, so I've been to Mexico. But here's the interesting thing. Wow, it would be dangerous for me to go back with my son-in-law to his to to his, to, pl- to to his, his place, place of where where he where his family began in Iguala, mm-hmm. Iguala, Mexico. That's where they took forty-two Mexican students and disappeared them, right? Okay, yeah, no, right. yeah, yeah. The mun- the municipality was involved. City hall was involved. The soldiers were involved, and the cartel were involved. So who do you call upon? Yeah. So you know. It's- me, people think of Mexico and they think of Cancun, right? And they <laughs> think of Mexico. Alcapulco, right? And they, and they think of Alcapulco. They think of a, 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 the a, resort a, a, part. A, a, beach the town. resort. Puerto beach. Vallarta, and it Cabo is all of, and it is, you know, Cosmos, it is all of that, right? But that ain't Mexico. You know, go to, it's different when you go into the interior of the island where the government, right, has less power mm-hmm. and sometimes the regime is structured and responds to criminal enterprises. Take on El Chapo. What's going to happen to you? You're going to die. Yep. Right. He's going to kill you, right? Uh, whether you, and, the, and I'm talking Mexican soldiers are killed and murdered, Mexican policemen, Mexican judges. Mexi- be a journalist in Mexico it's is a dangerous. very dangerous profession yeah. in Mexico. Mm-hmm. I mean, we're, these are the people that we're talking about that in a society we take for granted that you can't take for granted. So when I was talking to... Um, David, my uh, my son-in-law's family, his, his tias, they said, no, no, it's preferible que no venga. Iguala. Don't come and visit us. You're going to stand out like a sword. You know, yeah. there's a lot of kidnapping and there's a lot of things that happen to people that kind of dress and look like you and kind of stand out. Yeah. And that's sad, right? Yeah. But that's, an, that's, that's the Mexico you don't hear about a lot. Right, you know, right. let, okay, so you watch Narcos on Netflix and that's it, <laughs> right, right? Right, right? Well, guess what? Sometimes those series are, on Netflix are, really real. are real, <laughs> yeah. right? And so we've been dealing with it. And so when I look at the immigrants that come to the border, you know what I think about? I tell you, it just breaks my heart having two daughters, right? Yeah. I think of my daughters becoming 13, 14 years old. Mm-hmm. And I think of the drug cartel coming and knocking on my door and saying they're mine now. Dang. Right. Cause that's what they do, bro. Every day, right? Every day, and they sell them, right? Mm-hmm. And human trafficking is real, and they sell them, correct? And you know, if you do something, you die. You can't call nine one one. You can't do anything. You can't about call it. the mayor. They run that town in El Salvador. They run the whole spectrum of right. society. So you know, this is real. Yeah, if I lived in that environment, and my Jessica and my Omida reached puberty. Guess what? I would be making that journey through El Salvador, through Chiapas, all the way to the frontera, and trying to cross the border. Right. You know. Just to get away from. Yeah, all that. my parents. <laughs> they they were they were lucky. They jumped they jumped on an uh, airplane, airplane, right, mm-hmm. and came here. They didn't need no papeles, right. right? And what were they leaving? Not as bad a situation as this, but they were leaving a situation in which they had no future. They had no right. really hope. For their marriage. No progress. And p- to progress. So yeah, they came. Progress. Like you said, they were pretty courageous. They came to a country they knew nothing about, a language, a culture, a mores they knew nothing about. And they made something of themselves. And they returned in a more prosperous manner. And, you know, I just wish they had taught me Spanish, to tell you the <laughs> truth. That would have been, it would have been a lot easier I, transition. I, I, hey, well, it made you who you are, though. But right. that's yeah, what my right. dad said. It made me who I am. You don't remember because you two guys are just too young. 
1986, April 28th, the day before I got elected to the city council, Chewy won the first time. So he was already in the city <laughs> council for six weeks. But it took me a little longer. I didn't make it. I, there was a tie. And anyway, <laughs> so I had to run against on April 29th. And, uh, but Chuy was out there campaigning for me. And, um, and we go to Telemundo. And my opponent is Manny Torres. And the third question. Now, esto todo en español. Todo en español. There was no Univision in Chicago back then either. Okay. It was just Telemundo. Telemundo. Pelao. Yeah. Channel 44. Right? <laughs> that was it. That was it. That was it. Telemundo. So we go have a debate. 7 to 7.30. Half hour. You know, it's pretty cool because it's, it's, it's 11 hours before the polls are going to open, okay. right? 11 hours, 6 o'clock, start yes. voting. Prime showtime right there, man. Right? Okay, Let's so go. we go to the debate. Third question. What's the thing that most distinguishes you from your opponent? Pretty easy question. Plus, they had given us the questions in advance. Okay? That's the way Manny wanted it, not me. I, I, I go with the flow. But yeah. anyways. And he turns around. He says... The only language that is required in English, exactly how I'm saying it now, on Spanish language TV, I was just gonna on you. Telemundo, he starts speaking English saying that the only requirement to be in the Chicago City Council is speak English. Hmm. That that is the language of the government of the city, and he wants to make sure everybody knows that he's oh. proficient. And I'm sitting there aghast, and all I'm saying is control yourself. Wow. I'm telling myself... Control yourself. This is a good thing, but you have to know how to handle a good thing. Right? I'm just, he's speaking, and I'm like going. So they turned around to me, and they said, Your turn. Gutierrez, your turn. And I told them, Yo nunca le faltaría el respeto a nuestra gente como acaba este señor de hacerlo. Estamos en Univis. Estamos en Telemundo. For months, we've been debating in English. The first opportunity we get to debate in Spanish and you get to hear us in a language you understand. Y él prefiere hablarte en inglés. Mm. Cuando tú vienes a mi oficina, va a haber un letrero que dice, aquí se habla español y se respeta. <laughs> nice. The next day, they would interview people. Yeah. Who are you voting for? <laughs> you know, just before the, <laughs> before the results are out. And people would go, that guy who speaks Spanish, Gutierrez. <laughs> 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 I mean... That was it's, awesome. it's, can I just tell you something? Yeah. I go back to my dad when he told me, Recuerde, when I got to Puerto Rico, you speak to them. Yeah. And I kept thinking, Thank you, Dad. You gave me a clue as how to how to, how how you're gonna feel if you're watching this program. And indeed, you know, language, culture are important. It's also important how you build upon it. And I think we would be remiss if we didn't. So Chewy and I, the 100th anniversary of Harold Washington. Right. First black mayor of the city of Chicago. The first great mayor for me right. of yeah. the city of Chicago. I was Contigo. just going to ask you about him. Oh, too. He's, he, he, I mean, he gave Chewy a job at City Hall, which allowed us to understand how City Hall. He gave me a job at City Hall. Right. He let us see firsthand. Right. How city government works. It also gave us credentials, mm -hmm. right? So that when we ran for public, ¿y quién eres tú? Right? And you could, you know, Chuy could say he was the deputy commissioner of the water department. Right. You know, he had a high pollutant title. And, you know, I had so many thousands of people under my Your supervision, yeah. under my watch. Credibility. Okay, credibility. I know how the city works. I know how the budget works. Me, you know, I, I, I got a fancy title. I was administrative assistant in the mayor's office. Damn. Which ah, really meant I worked for one of the deputy mayors <laughs> doing a lot but of work. Yeah. So like in la oficina. Yeah, <laughs> right in la oficina. Hey, but that was better than be the assistant to the assistant assistant. <laughs> there you go. Okay? You remember when the Latinos used to be that, right? Go the get assistant coffee. to the assistant assistant. <laughs> go get right? coffee. The title was so long, it didn't fit on any door in any card, right? Okay. So at least administrative assistant is short enough it could fit on a card. Um, but my point is, he gave us the opportunity. Nice. And when they went to him and they said, City of Chicago is being sued because it discriminates against Latinos. That's what the Mexican American Legal Defense Fund is alleging in their lawsuit against the city of Chicago. What's your response, Mayor? He was so genuine. He was so, you know what he said? He said, guilty. We're guilty. I mean, when do you think of a mayor just say, we're guilty? Right. Right? He says, I'm going to send my lawyers over there to say we're guilty. They are discriminating against Latinos, right? That gave us 
four Latino city council members from one to four. It opened an opportunity for me to eventually go to Congress, for Chewy to go to the state Senate, county commissioner, and now in Congress. I mean, who gave us the infrastructure? I mean, look, let's be real. It takes money. Harold helped us finance our campaigns. Nice. We were running against a machine that had more money than it knew what to do with. See, I'm not making that. They had more money than they knew what to do with, hmm. right? Than was necessary. We was from Little Village. I was, we were like, where were we supposed to? The other thing is, he gave us credibility. He showed up at, there's a, a headline in the Chicago Sun-Times. And it has the back of Mayor Daly with his arm around me, right? And the picture's not of our faces. This is the back of our heads. Right. And you see his arm around him, and the headline is, Buddy's looking for votes. That's a big deal, bro, when you got the mayor of the city of Chicago and the media paying attention to you because a mayor is drawing. He's using his power, right? Right. He's using his power, his standing in society, to shine a light not on him, but on you to say, this is a good person. He has a following. I want you to help him get to the Chicago City Council. And so we're, gonna, we're going to, um, this uh, coming um, on the 12th, Tuesday, 530 at the Harold Washington Library. Oh, okay. There are going to be 15 of us that the Harold Washington Memorial Committee are going to get rewards. the 100th anniversary. If he'd be alive, he'd be 100 years old. Wow. Today, Harold, this, really? is coming Tuesday, this coming Tuesday. And Chewy and I are going to be two of the 15 people. Uh, uh, that are, that are going to awesome. receive uh, 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 a recognition that yeah. night. So I'm very proud of that moment. And and I, we would be remiss if we didn't say this. Look, yeah, I grew up with separate, but equal was the law of the land. Yeah. Mm. When there weren't voting rights. When there weren't civil rights. Right? right? When Roberto Clemente could not travel with his teammates. That's the America I grew up in. You know what? There's some black sisters and black brothers that gave up their lives. Martin Luther King gave up his life. Yeah. They gave up their lives in defense of civil rights, human rights, voting rights in this country and equality. And because they gave up their lives, there's a Voting Rights Act. Because of that Voting Rights Act, Maldef was able to go using the Voting Rights Act that they sacrificed their lives for. Right? We used it 40 years later to what? To sue the city of Chicago <laughs> and have a black mayor say we were guilty of it. Right? right? Now think about that. Yeah. Wow. We we stand on the shoulders mm -hmm. of people who came before us. So you ask me, is it, you know, how is that to take on a president, to take on a mayor? No, how is it to take on the brutality and the racism of the dogs, of of the police, of the murderers in the south as you marched for integration? Mm -hmm. That, you know, to sit in a jail in Birmingham, Alabama, you know, as Martin Luther King had to do time and time again, and to be savagely beaten, you know, you, we, we know. Right. Martin Luther King came to Chicago for, for open housing. Le metieron un pied una piedra en la cabeza and opened up a gash in his head. Hmm. And they asked Martin Luther King, they said, they said so, Reverend, do you have any comments? He says, let's have this. In the whole of the South, I never saw the hatred in people's eyes, as I've seen in the eyes of Chicagoans today. Wow. Wow, Martin Luther King. He said, because there was hatred here in the city yeah. of Chicago. That's the Chicago that I grew up. So look, we stand on their shoulders. They sacrificed their lot. Their churches were bombed. They were murdered. They were killed. They were lynched so that we could have voting. And so, so I stand. So you know what? I want to be respectful of that and to say thank you. Because it was the same Voting Rights Act that we in Chicago used to say we need a fourth congressional district, we're going to court. Right. And Maldef led the charge, the Mexican American Legal Defense Fund. So it wasn't like one day they said, oh, it's time to have a Latino go to Congress. Let's give them a chance. Right. No, that ain't the way it worked. You guys had The a way it worked is people died, people sacrificed their lives, right? They passed laws. And guess what? We utilized those laws and went to court and sued on the basis of those laws. And that's why we got those seats in the city council right. and in the Congress of the United States. And not just me. Latinos across this country have used the Voting Rights Act to get school board uh, um, elections, to get uh, state reps, state senator. Now we got to do something with it. Right. It's not enough to just, oh, I'm a Latino. 
Because I sometimes I just feel like there's more of us and we grow in population, but we're not growing in power. Mm-hmm. We're not growing in influence. That makes sense. Yeah. And so we need to grow in power and influence right. because estamos creciendo en población, pero no influencia. So I think, look, the last thing, you know, Harold Washington, everybody talks about, oh, I'm so woke, I have this new policy as mayor. <laughs> right. I'm protecting the immigrants, <laughs> right? I'm not going, yo, let me just tell you something. You can go back to 1984. Is that 38 years ago? That's a long time ago. (laughs) That's a long time ago, right? A long, long time ago. Maria Cerda was the director of the mayor's office of employment and training, cabinet position. Okay. Carol Washington gave Maria Cerda. Her husband, and they were La Raza Cosmica before my daughter and David were La Raza, because her husband was Judge David Cerda, prominent Mexicano jurist and and, uh, judge. Yeah. Right? And she was Maria Celda, Board of Education Chief, right? She was on the Board of Education when Puerto Ricans were the assistant to the assistant. assistant. <laughs> Maria Celda was in charge, right? She came to City Hall to come see her boss, an immigration agent stopped her and told her, whoa, before you show us some idea and can prove you're a citizen of the United States, you're not getting in that building. And you know what Harold Washington did in 1984? He didn't have to wait 40 years later, right? Right. He passed an executive order. He signed an executive order immediately telling every city department and every city worker, you do not ask people their citizenship or their immigration status. This is an immigration-free city. I mean, you want to talk about a city that was free from immigration. So you couldn't. You could register your kids. Nadie te podía preguntar your, your immigration status. Who did that? Harold Washington. Wow. So it wasn't just that we had a black mayor. Right, right. We had a progressive black mayor who was doing things that today people are discovering as unique. Unique? For him, it was part of the who, body politics of who he was, who he was right? Yeah. And so, man, I love that man. Um, I know Chicago loved him. We're going to celebrate his 100th uh, birthday this, uh, this Tuesday at the trying at to, Washington. I'm trying to find a picture because I'm, I'm going to throw you off. Okay. I was in kindergarten when he was there. Okay. There you go. There you go. Uh, and I took a picture with Harold Washington. Oh, you did! Oh, yeah. nice. So I'm trying to look uh, for it right now. I'm not trying to be Take disrespectful. No, 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 no. But I, es que tengo que hacerla. I want to see it though. I, I, I want to see it. You know, I gotta got, dust it off you a little gotta bit. Gotta dust it off a little bit. <laughs> but I will tell you, um, he taught me so much, and and he gave me such opportunity. So we had Harold Washington. You know, you look at and I, you know, invite you. <laughs> to your program. Oh, yeah. It's a lot closer for him. He'll, he'll be here in like 15 minutes from his prison. <laughs> oh, man, let's make it happen. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, he's, God, right, he's, he's right down the block relative to me, right? <laughs> my nice. point is, um, my point is, we owe so much to him, right? Right. But we also owe so much to those brave warriors of the 50s and the 60s that led a civil rights movement. Here's the interesting thing. Wow. Look at what we're living today. We thought the issue of gay rights, that was a established issue, right? We did that, right? Okay, LGBTQ, marriage, equality, right? But now they're trying to reverse it. Voting rights, right? The same Voting Rights Act that I, right, is under attack by the Congress and the courts of the hmm. nation, right? Union rights is under, are under attack. I mean, when you start looking, right, Immigrant rights, where we're finally making progress. Right. I mean, who passed the Immigration Reform and Control Act that allowed 3 million people in 1986 that were undocumented to get legal? Ronald Reagan. A lot of Ronald presidents. Reagan, Republican president of the United States of America, is credited with a massive infusion of legalization. What happened? We're going backwards, brothers and sisters. Right. We're going backwards. Under attack are women's rights in this country, Correct. our gay rights in this country, our immigrant rights, our labor rights, our environmental rights. They are all under attack, right? So we need to be very careful because there was a lot of sacrifice and work to make get this country straight, yeah. right? To make it a better place. And I tell the youth that's listening, continue being fearless. Continue going out there. Look, I'm... I'm, 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 I'm just get, say one thing that I think is very important. When we look at immigration reform and everybody says, unless there's an absolute pathway to citizenship, I cannot support that. 
And I'm like going, man, it must be comfortable from your point of privilege yep. to be able to say, if it doesn't include an absolute, do I want that? I want that. It's been in every bill I've proposed. Every bill. And I proposed the first bill. Senator Kennedy, Senator McCain, interesting Republican Democrat, Correct. Flake from Arizona. And I, we introduced the first comprehensive bipartisan immigration bill, 800 pages, 1984. We introduced it together. It had a pathway to citizenship. But guess what? If tomorrow they told me that my immigrants, that my Salvadoreño, my Mexicanos, that they were going to give them a work permit that was renewable, that they wouldn't have to fear being separated from their, from their husbands and wives, from their children, and guaranteed them safety, you know what I would say? I would listen. So I look at me, un señor, Mexicano. He said, you know, that stuff's good, Gutierrez, about me voting and being just like you and having all the rights that you got. I got that. But you know what? Every day I wake up, go to work, and wonder if I'm going to make it home. Because if the migra catches me, I'm gone. How do I raise my children? Right. How can I be a husband? He told me, buscame papeles. If you ask people, buscame papeles. I want to get right with the law. Yeah. And you know, here's the other thing he told me. See how strategic he was. He said, ¿Ves mis hijos? Son nacido aquí en Estados Unidos. They were born here, my children. One day they're going to grow up. Van a crecer. Van a ser hombres y mujeres. Ellos se encargarán de castigar a aquellos que me trataron a mí con tanta miseria. Mm. They will be here, right? To take care of those, to punish yeah. those that treated their mom and dad so miserably. Great and I was like going, wow. Yeah. He's like saying, but what did he say? Let me be a dad. Right. Let me be a husband. Get me something that stopped, and you know, this was when, and it's still going on, right? It, the deportations are going on. Right. The only thing yeah, is now stopped. they don't they don't pay as much attention to them. And part of it is that I think we need to do more in terms of our leadership. So I shared with you, so I'm coming back first week of June, our nation's future. We're going to start a national uh, um, immigrant rights. So it's going to be, uh, it's, I, want it, I want it to be integrated by black leadership. Uh, one out of 10 uh, immigrants to the United States is a black American. Okay. I know everybody go, really, Gutierrez? Yes. <laughs> one out of 10. They're Haitians, right? They come from the Caribbean. Right. Interesting note, 80,000 Dominicans, when they filled out the census in 2020, self-described themselves, self-identified themselves as black. Oh, wow. Right? So when you look at our, our black community, of one out of 10... So we need to we year. need to continue. I gotta put my glasses on. Yeah, I, see this. <laughs> I, got, oh, I left it in the coat. Oh, uh, here you go. The purple ones are the good ones. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Look at that. That's a good picture. We'll Look give it to Fry okay. so he can post okay. it. Okay, but but. Look at that smile. Bro. Huh? Not well, only, not Harold only, Washington smile or my smile? No, you got a, you got a badass smile. I'll give you that. I got, I, I'll give you that. But but look at it. He's really genuinely happy. Yeah, of course, right? of course. He's genuinely happy. Y así era en toda. ¿Tú sabes lo que es el alcalde de la ciudad de Chicago? Y ver a estos dos bellos niños aquí, ¿verdad? Y abrazarlo y tomar una y con esa sonrisa. Yeah. Huh? I, I think that one came out in the newspaper. Oh, yeah, I, yeah. I, I believe you, brother. That you know, you're blessed, man. Because you have a picture. You gotta yeah. print that out, man. You wow. Print that out. That, that's, that, All right, so I'll show you the section because he he out he. Wow. He, I could have been a politician with that smile. Wow, Look at that. Man. Yeah. So so I enjoy the whole part, you know, uh, progress and and how much uh, everything has has advanced. Yes. Um, but I also kind of like ask myself. Don't uh, swipe left, all right? <laughs> I, I also ask myself as a, as a 40, now 43-year-old man uh -huh. that came out of a little village as, okay. as, as Jesse did. Yeah. He's a bit younger. But what would you, uh, like, what would you pinpoint that? Because, you know, I look back and I'm like, okay, well, I'm 43, but the areas that were bad when I was a kid are uh -huh. still bad. Okay. And and uh, I know that you're big on um, community has to you know help the government and mm -hmm. and, and be together, but um, I mean what really has happened you know where's the accountability in 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 the I don't know if it's like 
the, the the alderman is it community is it mm-hmm. family is it a, a whole you know spectrum of things because um south chicago is still south chicago i mean mm-hmm. it, it hasn't progressed much little village it's progressed but it's still considered not great you know it's not uh, the north side of chicago per se mm-hmm. so what what would you uh what would you pinpoint you yeah. think yeah so look when we spoke earlier um i talked about income inequality Correct. And it's getting worse in the United yeah, States. I, I agree. mean, rich people are getting immensely richer, richer yep. and there's stagnation and or uh, people are losing their buying power, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, so that inequality is growing. So that's something structurally, right, that we need to deal with. Correct. We need to take on those that are wealthy in this country and demand that they pay more, right? Okay. So that others can have more decency in their lives, more equality in their lives, more quality. What is that American dream, right? Right. Now, I say that there are there has been progress made. But look, I say to all my Latinos that just a few blocks from here in Cicero, mira que carajo, you're 80% of the population in Cicero. Right. Why do you have this... A uh, man that goes around calling Mexicans wetbacks as Dominic as the president of Cicero. Part of it is also us taking Our fault. you. You know, way, you yeah. went to the commu- you went to Cicero. You moved there because you wanted to leave the city. I get that, right? Right. But mm. este hombre que hace ahí, you're eighty yeah. percent. Ya es tiempo y lleva ahí año. So my only point is, there's some of that. Some of it is our own leadership. Some of it is our own leadership. Look, we grew 301,000 in the state of Illinois. Right. Right? 2010 to 2012. 301,000 more Latinos. There are fewer people in the state of Illinois today than there were 10 years ago. Can you imagine if it had not been for the 301,000 Latinos (laughs) that have moved here? Okay. So we saved congressional districts, right? We saved the state of Illinois. And did you see the Latino state reps and state senators Fight for one more state rep or one more state rep, state senate seat? Mm-hmm. Not one more, papito. We've decreased the population, the state. We increased by Latinos, and there's not more seats for us? Right. You know, I, I'm pretty proud of, of uh, Alderman Villegas because at least in the city council, they're fighting for more representation so that they can go and negotiate a bigger piece of the pie. The right. other thing is you brought the picture of Harold Washington. Under Harold Washington, there was much more equality in terms of the distribution of resources, right. of resources in the city of Chicago, in terms of job opportunities in the city of Chicago. And in the end, government does play a big role in the economics of our society in the United States of America, Correct. right? Um, so there is that. I really think that when I look today, and I think of the area around the brickyard, right, the uh, uh, the Brighton Cragen area of the city of Chicago, which I'm more used to understanding. I'll tell you, I see lots of Latinos that are homeowners. Right. And right. you could go down those streets, mira, y esa gramita está cortadita, lo más linda, y están pintaditas las casas. You know, it, it looks pretty middle class. Right. You know, they're homeowners, they are buying homes, they are controlling their communities. Mm-hmm. Um, now, was it like that when I was the alderman back in... In, in Humboldt Park, it probably wasn't, but we never got to see what it would really be because gentrification was so massive as it is happening in Pilsen. Correct. Right? It's like, good. So you, you don't think, our neighborhood's getting so good, they're moving us out. Right, And right. this ain't the first time they moved us out. Yeah. In the 60s, they used urban renewal, the war against poverty. They called it urban renewal. We called it urban removal because <laughs> yeah. every time they renewed something, they removed one of us from the neighborhood. Now they're not using so much government, right? It's the private sector because everybody wants to live close to downtown. Right. And fortunately for us, Pilsen and like Wicker Park, right? I mean, they're like strategically located, right? right? Uh, from a geographical point of view, pero ya, mijo. I couldn't win in the 26th Ward as it's constructed today if that had been the 26th Ward <laughs> um, uh, nearly 40 years ago. It would, I would have been impossible. Number mm-hmm. one, it would have been a white, all the manic seat. Yeah. It wouldn't have been 65% Latino. So as you see our population growing, but is there still stagnation in many aspects? Yes. 
But when you have a state legislature that passes uh, uh, education reform uh, by having us elect a school board versus that's democracy. I'm for all an elected school board. Okay. Right? But coño, when Miguel Del Valle was down there all by himself, right, back in 1990, Senator Miguel Del Valle, and he didn't have no help from the machine, and they did education reform, every local school council allowed what? Everybody to vote, regardless of whether you had papers or not, mm-hmm. right? Now, if you want to vote for the elected school board, you got to be a citizen of the United States of America. Now, what is more fundamental in your life and controlling your life than who educates and who funds your children's education and how it's funded and what priorities? But we're going to have hundreds of thousands of our people who are permanent residents, right, who have not achieved. They're not going to be able to vote on who the elected school board is. So why is our state legislature, right, after we had a mayor named Harold Washington who said this is a sanctuary city and no one will come to this city as long as I'm mayor. I'm signing this executive order and be able to question people's authenticity and their right to government service on the basis of their immigration status. And Miguel Del Valle can go down there and reform the system and get people to vote. Now we're going backwards. So some of it is we need to understand that we also have to hold our elected officials accountable. Correct. Now, an immigration reform, I'm proud of the fact that Chuy Jesus Garcia was one of three members of the Hispanic Congressional Caucus who stood up to Democratic leadership and said we demand that immigration reform be included. Right? right? Three? Pero si son 37 Latino. What happened to the other 34? Right. They stayed quiet. And what happened? I mean, well, all of the groups came together. We signed the public letter. And this is just to show you how we're invisible. Right. Mira, you're talking about Churla. You're talking about Casa de Maryland. You're talking about all these organizations that are renowned across America for immigrant rights and for civil rights and for human rights. Very established organizations. 35 of them signed a letter to the Hispanic Congress, published it in the Hill. Right. Mm-hmm. One of the publications that published in the Hill saying, why aren't you doing your job? You know, if 35 prominent LGBTQ community uh, 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 organizations challenged the gay members of Congress that they weren't doing your job, that'd be at top of the news on CNN. I assure you. Right. Can you imagine that the NAACP? Yeah. Right. Yeah. And black organizations saying to the black caucus, how come you ain't doing your job? Can you imagine uh, the National Organization for Women and other national women's organizations say to the women member of Congress, how come you're not doing your job? They'd be on the top of the news. Right. Yet, 35 established Latino organizations challenged the Hispanic Congressional Caucus. Nada. Wow. Didn't break through, right? It's not important. It's not a story. So part of it is we need to change structurally, right? How it is information, right, is garnered and given. Because if I'm one of those Latino members of Congress, I'm like going, (laughs) if these 35 could get together and denounce me and nobody knows, Mm -hmm. I'm just going to, I'm not going to change my behavior unless there's a consequence, right, for my actions when I'm denounced. So there aren't repercussions. I'm proud of Chewy. He was one of the three that did demand. And it was, it it was, a lot of the organizations that didn't stand up, you have to remember one thing. As I've traveled through this country, the left in America has never really taken up the issue of immigrant rights. The left in America has never really embraced and taken up the issue of immigrant rights. Do you remember uh, um, 2006? Okay. Do you remember the three, 400,000 people that marched in downtown Chicago? That was organized by El Pistolero and a bunch of other Mexicans. I was going to bring that oh, up. Come on now. Who organized that? <laughs> Who yeah. organized that? And in L.A., there was a million yeah. people. It was uh, always on May 1st. But this is... this. But, but uh, yeah, but why does it take three, 400,000 of us to break <laughs> through the news? But uh, <laughs> aparte de eso, it, like, we stopped... I mean, I was part of Univision that time. I, okay. I, I was uh, Pistolero's producer. Oh, That's well, why. They, so, I, 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 I didn't so, know that coming on the program. <laughs> so you so, see, I, I, gave him, I gave him his props. No, no, yeah. no. But it, it just, like, it, in a lot of... Uh, a lot of we got a lot of backlash on that porque it's like, you know, estamos perdiendo un día de, de trabajo mm-hmm. to be here. But what's being done? 
Like nothing. Yeah, it was on the news. It was a big thing. We stopped but, Sensenbrenner dead in his tracks. Right. But but then again, it was just like qué pasó después de eso, and that was. And I feel like sometimes uh, some of the people, like immigrants, immigrants, no quieren no quieren enseñar cara because they know they they're not going to win the fight. You know that that's Thank a problem. You. You, you know what? Your point is well taken. Yeah. So I feel I have a responsibility, mm -hmm. the convocatoria, to say let's fight. Let's do it. Let's do this. Mm -hmm. Um, because as I walk through the city of Chicago, every day I'm blessed. They're, I'm telling you, I had breakfast this morning, and like this Latino couple, they came up to me and they go, it's not the same without you. <laughs> I go to Costco and this Dominican cashier goes, Carajo Gutierrez, I used to love going to vote for you. <laughs> but I, I don't hear nobody, I, I, there's nobody for me to, they, they tell me this. Yeah. I don't feel like I have anybody. I hear this time and time again. Now, Part of it is I'm not responsible for COVID. Right. I'm not responsible for inflation. I, you know, I'm not responsible for a lot of bad things because right. I wasn't there, right? right? So part of it is la añoranza. Oh, I, we miss you, right? Those, those days that were better. But I think there is a genuine sense that they want someone to speak for them. Right. That there is a... So who's the national Latino leader? Excuse me, I can hear a pin drop. Yep. Right? <laughs> what? There's no voice. You mean there's 61 million of us? Right. And there's, there's no... nobody who nationally brings us together as, as a leader? Boy, you know, we need a, a Martin Luther King. They need a morning we need radio. A Gandhi. <laughs> morning radio show. <laughs> well, well, you know, uh, and, and... you know, you know, you could say, yeah, you used to work for the pistolero, but look, the pistolero was responding. I believe, to people who were listening to his oh, program. Of course, of course. You know, he goes, esa es mi raza, ellos escuchan mi radio, right. y, 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 y ellos me siguen a mí. But he, again, just like Residente did, right? And just like Bep, he used his position of power. His popularity. His, his popularity to yeah. bring people to. I couldn't have done it. Mm -hmm. as, as well known as I was, as many people, if I had got, number one, where was I going to get the money to pay that many uh, <laughs> commercials to tell people to come out? Pero él lo hizo. People believed in him because he spoke about their stories. You were the producer. You know the stories he would have every day. Uh, it was the right. trials and tribulation, the pain of our community. Yeah. No, and I saw it firsthand because then, then it became uh, what sucked about it. Mm -hmm. it. It became a marketing thing because, okay. like, ya, ya de allí, este, veía los grupos with their, with their banners. Sale mi disco ahora. Or sale right. este día. And it was just like. I, I was... get you. And you know what? <laughs> if I get to do it over again, I would have bought, like, half a million American flags. I'm going to tell you why. It's unfortunate that in this country, the right wing, the fascists, have taken over the American flag. Mm -hmm. It's their flag. Why is it only their flag? They can have the Confederate flag if they want. They <laughs> lost the Civil War. Right. Right? We, we abolished slavery. We had a war about that. But they have the American flag. Why don't those of us on the progressive side, right, also, so the thing I would change is, I would say, listen, if I could go back to 2006, I would say, ven acá, esa bandera de México, linda. Esa bandera de, from Poland, nice. Esa. But what we're asking for is you to be allowed to have this yes. as your bandera. Right. Right. Right? Yeah, that's a great point. I'm not saying for you to forget where you came from. Hmm? I'm not asking you to assume. I'm asking you to integrate yourself. Yeah. I'm asking you to say to the rest of the American public, I want to be like you. Mm -hmm. I want to have American citizenship. I want to contribute to this country. I want to follow the same rules, the same regulations. Because let's say I had this jacket on, right? And I walked up to my wife. And over here there was a pin with a picture of my ex-girlfriend. <laughs> right? <laughs> There's a picture of my right. ex-girlfriend here. We'll be at your she funeral. She might look at me and say, well, yeah, I'll be at the funeral. But you get my point, right? Yeah, yeah. No, my no, wife no. might say, okay, that used to be the country, you know, that used to be where you were from. Mm -hmm. But I'm today. I'm the present and I'm the future. Right. So I'll put all those pictures away. And any sane man better get rid of all those pictures of that ex-girlfriend and not be putting on their phone thinking it's hidden somewhere. Right? You put that away because that's the past. Yeah. So all I'm trying to say is that's our flag too. 
the American dream. And we got to talk about what does immigration reform mean? It means a better house. It means a better salary. Right? It means better education. Because we get, come on, brother. There's 10 million of us in a permanent underclass in the society. Of the 61 million, 10 million of us. One out of six is undocumented. 90% of everybody deported from the United States of America is Latino. Right. You know, we have a problem. They live in a permanent underclass. They say, ah, pero ellos llegaron ayer. Llegaron ayer. The majority of the 10 million have been here over 20 years. Yeah. Back to the time of the pistolet. Over 20 years. years. And they're like going, ¿qué pasa? Yeah. So look, Democrats, Republicans, in some instances, in a lot of it, you treat us the same way. You do not respect our community. So we have to understand that, that this whole thing about party loyalty has really been a detriment to our community. Now, I'm going to be tweet, pick between good and bad, <laughs> okay. which is many times our option, yeah. right? But we also have to create excellence in terms of those. I was joking around with you guys a little, but it's not a joke. I asked myself, J.B. Pritzker, what's he done for Latinos in three and a half years? I want to see what his commercial is going to say on Univision and Telemundo, now that he doesn't have me, right? to be his spokesperson for him. I want to see what he's done. Right. Well, let me see. We grew by 301,000. Did we get any more seats? No. Do we get to vote for the local uh, elected school board in Chicago? No. no. I mean, I don't see him really addressing us, right? And talk. his commercial that I've been watching this week is, I have saved the state of Illinois $267 million. <laughs> That's it. Yeah, and you screwed the Latinos out of those $267 million. Do, do, so do you think the, the Latino community or the Latino immigrant community here uh, overall, overall, mm -hmm. tu crees que uh, you can compare them to the, the African-American in the 60s? Here's what I got to say to you. In our letter that was sent to the Hispanic Congressional Caucus, I'm happy you raised that issue. You know what we wrote? Why can't you be like the Black Caucus when it comes to voting rights? Wow. It's just true, brother. You know those brothers and sisters when it comes to voting rights, right? They're powerful. They're straight. They use their power to get it done, right? Mm -hmm. um, whereas conversely, do you hear the Hispanic Caucus doing the same thing? And people say, but why should it just be our responsibility? You want to know something? Somebody's got to take charge. Right. Black people took charge in the 50s and the 60s so that we could advance. Right. Guess what? If we want to advance on immigration reform, which to me is the human rights issue of our moment, just remember 10 million people live in a permanent underclass. Permanent underclass for more than two decades. What does that mean? They didn't get their wages there they were supposed to get. They couldn't buy the house. And if they did, who knows how they financed and it. And they're still yeah. paying taxes. And there's. Yeah. yeah, they pay taxes on everything. <laughs> Look, they pay all the taxes. It's like, well, you know, they don't pay taxes. I said, yeah, the last time I went to the grocery store, there was a line for the people who didn't have papers, the undocumented, <laughs> right? And it says, stand in this line because you, <laughs> you don't have to pay no taxes. Right. Buy a house in Cook County. You ain't got papers? No Cook County property taxes for you. Yeah. Wait a minute, this is the line at the gas station. Hey, it's only $3.10 here because guess what? There are no taxes on your gasoline. <laughs> They're going to say, wow, did the Democrats do that? Yeah, we take credit for that. Yeah. We reduce the price of gasoline. <laughs> My point is we pay all the taxes and we do some of the incredibly hardest work in this country. Yeah. Brothers, I, I, I invite America and I invite the news media, go to where women are on their knees picking garlic. Go to where men and women in South Texas are picking onions under that devastating heat of the summer, right? Go to meatpacking plants across the country. People lose their hands and their fingers, and they destroy the, the, their arms and their limbs are destroyed because of the work. You know, next time you go and you open up a can and there's meat in it and you, you cook it, you know, that's a Mexicano who made that happen for you, bro. I'm just going to tell you. And if it wasn't, it was an African or, or a Haitian. It was somebody of color that's, that's an immigrant to this country that made that happen for you, number one. You know, you go to the grocery store and you see lettuce, tomatoes, you know, uh, what is it, cucumbers, and, and, and you see all the fruits and all the vegetables. Well, who the hell do you think <laughs> yeah. went out in the fields and made that happen for you? So here's my point. 
When you talk about essential workers, yes, those people that are in nursing homes, nurses, doctors, policemen, firemen, they're essential workers. Right. But in any economy, people got to eat. Mm-hmm. And who's an essential worker? Los Mexicanos. Los Mexicanos are essential <laughs> workers because they make this economy work. Yeah. Right? You see that, oh, there's so many at the border. Let me tell you, the single largest, um, um, how would I say this, uh, portion of the Mexican economy, right, is remesas. Right. It, there, there's more money in the Mexican economy due to remesas than to, because of COVID-19, than to tourism. They, they bypass petroleum. Can you imagine if the Mexicanos stop sending money back to Mexico? <laughs> you see people wow. at the border. They stay in Mexico because they get to have their homes. They get they get the food. I mean, they get clothing. Their economic situation changes for them. Yeah. Of course, you know, I don't, you know, I don't know if you guys do Western Union money gram here. Of course, if I had my abuelita allá in Iguala, I'd be sending her a debit card and saying, "Here, just go to the bank, man. We ain't got no more wire no transfers. Worry, no worry right. Don't worry about that. <laughs> every, other, sell every, you. <laughs> every first Tuesday of the month, you know, you got your you money. I put you. it in there for you. You can watch your balance." Yeah. My point is, look, we are an essential part. Tanto odio that they want. Mexico, Mexico, Mexico. Brothers, <clears throat> 7 million Americans, 7 million, wake up every day, go to work, thanks to Mexican consumers. Let me say that. 7 million Americans wake up every day, go to work, thanks to Mexican consumers. Not in the United States, in Mexico. Mexico, the, 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 the people of Mexico, right? Employ 7 million Americans. How? You, you guys have been to Mexico? <laughs> it's all there. Walmart's there. Everybody's there, guys. Yeah. Costco's there. Costco, they're all there in Mexico. So, what kind of cars do you think they buy in Mexico? <laughs> right. right? Okay, I'll show you what kind of cars they built. Cars built in America, they built. Refrigerators, stove, todo lo que sea. All of that comes from our economy and from and from being able to uh, because Mexican workers, so as Mexico increases its purchasing and their economy is improved and their workers earn better wages, guess who creates more jobs here in the United States of America? Because now they can buy more things. Really, we need a hemispheric approach. People do say, yo soy americano. And when they say that, that means they come from one of the 50 states, right? <laughs> right. Well, you, you and I both know that's bullshit, Correct. right? <laughs> because... Y los de Centroamérica no son americanos. Y los de Suramérica no son americanos. Uh, I did hear americano in the name, right? right? We're all Americans. We're from the Americas, Correct. right? North, Central, and South America. Let's have a hemispheric approach, right? That's how you beat the cartels. Kind of like that. You, yeah, that's how you beat. You got to connect us. Because on each side of the border... Right, the cartels are causing havoc and mayhem and destabilization and murder. Right in Mexico, and in here, drug addiction in the United States of America. Who wins? They win. They win. So let's get together instead of pointing fingers, right, and dehumanizing us, right, and collecting political points through hatred and, and bigotry. Let's stop that nonsense and let's fight the real people, our common enemies, and they're on both sides of. They're on both sides of the border. Let's fight them together. So there's a lot of good reasons. Seven million American jobs depend just on Mexican consumers every day in Mexico. I was just there, as I told you, baptizing myself. There's a lot of things. But unfortunately, my brothers, thank you for, you know, allowing me to be part of your podcast. But a lot of times, these things just aren't. If you do not have Latino anchors, right? who then employ Latino producers, y tú lo sabes, mm-hmm. so, me dijiste que trabajaste, and you know how that works, right? Siempre exactly. lo dicen, cada semana lo dicen. No, but it's good, I didn't know that, yeah. but, I, but I'm thankful I said pistolero before he said <laughs> uh, But here's my point, they hire people, like me, when I got to Congress, yes, uh, I hired Janice Fuentes, right? Now, I want to make clear to everybody, we had lots of non-Hispanic. That was the politically correct words they told me to refer to white people. Non-Hispanic. Yeah, just say, 
Tell them you have Hispanic and non-Hispanic uh, staff members. <laughs> but here I'm going to just be clear. Doug Schofield, Billy Weinberg, you can go on down, Doug Riv. I mean, you can go on down and check, right? right. Mine was a multinational, multicultural staff, but it has Latino leadership. And in Chicago, you wanted to become a citizen? What did you have to do? This is lady. She applied for a green card. Mm -hmm. Y la pobrecita left the application in, in, in a bag, right, on the CTA train. Mm. Okay. This other guy comes, he sees it, he opens it up, he sees there's immigration papers in there. It look important to him. There's photos and all this stuff. Do you think he went to the lost and found? No. Nope. You think he called the police? No. Nope. You know what he did? Threw it away. He called, no, he called our office. He said, Yo sé que ustedes quieren a los inmigrantes. I know you love immigrants. I just found these papers. I figured you guys would take good care of these papers. Mm. Nice. People had what? A sense of, if you're, going, if you're going to find some immigrant papers, give them to Gutierrez. He knows He's going to know what to do with yeah. them. That lady is a citizen of the United oh, States wow. today. As soon as we got them, we called her, brought her in. We told her, you don't have to pay your lawyer no more. We got you. We oh. know how to do this, nice. and we're going to take you through the submit process, it. and we're going to submit them for you because I was, there are 435 members of the House and 100 senators. All of us qualify to do immigration work. Only one person was ever authorized by Homeland Security, right, to do immigration work of the 535 members of the House and the Senate. That's Congressman Luis Gutierrez, because I'm the only one that gave a damn to make that happen. And now I want to come wow. back. And nationalize that. Look, you say, what's the issue? There are 9 million people who today can apply for American citizenship. Mm. Okay? I'm going to give it to you straight. Wow. 7 million of them are Mexicanos. Okay? Los polacos y los asiáticos, they count the days, bro, of the five years. Now, we have some other hurdles, right? We have families. Lots of people have to apply. It's expensive. I understand. But let's try to overcome those hurdles. Why don't we call on corporate America? You're all into the red, white, and blue. Well, guess what? I got 7 million people that qualify to become American citizens today. But they need to make that down payment. Right. So guess what, banking system? How about some loans at no interest so that you can help people become American citizens? How about corporations that you just start giving? Because now I go to Jules. I go everywhere. Me están pidiendo dinero. Could you give us a contribution? Well, why right. don't we just have like a month of those contributions and guess what? We'll raise a few hundred million dollars oh, yeah, yeah. across this country and we'll help people. But those are the kinds of demands we have to make on corporate America and say, these people, you keep talking about the undocumented. The undoc no, Papito, worry about those of us that got papers and help those of us that have become American citizens and you will see us grow. Because when you become a citizen, just so you know, this is statistically proven, right? Mm -hmm. You have, to, you have a better house, a bigger car. Your wages increase. Now imagine what happens when we take 10 million of our brothers and sisters and we gave them working documents. Right. I mean, a social security card and a work document. You know what's going to happen? I know what's going to happen. They're all going to, I know what they're going to do. And, and uh, a lot of corporate Americans are going to call me and say, all they're doing is organizing unions <laughs> for better wages. <laughs> and, and they're causing, I said, yeah, because now they can. Mm -hmm. They can't. Now they can. Oh, so if you, if you say, oh, look, I want equality, right? Well, guess what? There has to be equality for immigrants too. There has to be equality for those 10 million people. And let's just be clear. They can't be equality for them until they get their papers straight. Correct. Until they get their documents straight so they can have a social security. You go to church and they say, hey, you know, you don't have to be like an evangelical or the Archbishop of Chicago to know, right? Amar a tu prójimo como a ti mismo. To love your neighbor as you love yourself. You ain't got to be a theologian to remember that one because Lord knows I'm not. Right. Right. But I remember, what does that mean? Everybody says it when they go to church on Sunday, right? Right after the Our Father. Right? And they go get their communion as the Catholic. Sorry for all non Catholics out there. <laughs> but that's the way we do it, right? Well, guess what? That means when you leave church, you got to fight so your paper. The person who lives next door to you, don't have paper, has the papers you got. Because you love them as you love yourself. 
And if you truly love yourself, you want what? The best for yourself. Yeah. Right? So you got a decent house, you should work for him to have a decent Look, it's all it's not about taking away from you, right? It's about expanding the 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 pot of riches. <clears throat> it exists. This country is immensely, immensely rich. Mm-hmm. Right? Of course. We got lots and lots of money and lots of lot. We just have to learn how we distribute it. And you know, yeah. again, to all of your pot. Look, the next time you go by and you go by the fruit and the vegetable section or you go by the meat part, here's what I want you to think about. I want you to think about that woman who's out in the field picking those grapes that you're eating. And I want you to think about her vulnerability. She can't dial 911. She can't call anybody for help. She's vulnerable, alone, and in many cases being abused and exploited. And not just financially, but in some of the most heinous ways I know. I've heard their stories. That happens. So don't look at those fruits and vegetables in the same light, right? There's somebody suffering. Te gusto. You like having them? You like the quality? You like the availability? Yeah. Fight for that woman, man. So that... so that, so that when she gets her papers, when she gets straight, the first thing she can do is call 911 and put ese hijo de puta in jail, man, that's been abusing her. Because mm-hmm. that's happening out there each and every day. People are getting charged rent for just slums. For slums. And that's where they're having to raise their children. No tienen papeles. I've seen this. Not only in California, in Tampa, in Mississippi, in Texas. It's happening all across our country. Ladies and gentlemen, extreme poverty and exploitation still exists in this. And you know where they're at mostly? In immigrant communities where they're working. They're not living off the government. They're working each and every day. So my point is, yeah, it's a big issue for me. It's an important issue for me because it's got to be important to somebody. Because if it ain't important to somebody, then nobody's going to give a hoot. Right? So it's been important to me. For some people, the environment is important. Women's rights important. LGBTQ rights important. I tell them, yes, right on, brothers and sisters. And I'm joining you. And if you allow my 10 million to join you, guess what? You just expanded the rights of all of those groups because we're all in this together. And that's why when I speak, I try to, to let people know that when I was in the Chicago City Council in 1986, it was July. I just got there. They had the gay rights ordinance. I was just got there. 1986. Mm. I mean, Obama finally came around to gay marriage, what, like five years ago? Yeah. yeah. Right? Like the last year of his president. Eso porque Biden lo dijo. <laughs> Biden went and said, I'm for gay marriage. And they asked the president, well, what do you think? <laughs> right? I mean, he just came around to it. He was elected twice president of the United States. Yep. We were asked to do that, right, in 1986 to stand up for the human rights. Chui and I, we both voted. Only 18, it was, I still remember, 32 to 18, it was defeated, right? Mm. But guess what, man? We stood up. We stood up for immigrants. We stood up for the rights of the LGBTQ community, for women's rights. We're standing up for labor rights. How many times haven't you seen me at a picket line, right? (laughs) Or trying to shut down uh, some establishment because they ain't treating the workers right. I do that. I did that all of the time. You guys remember the, the windows and doors, uh, when President Obama got elected uh, in 2008, there was a fabrica on the north side, right? It's right off of North Avenue. It's called okay. Windows and Doors, Chicago Windows and Doors. They shut down the company. Era casi toda raza, <laughs> right? So they said, here, you're fired. Friday's your last day. And they looked around. And they said, what about all these windows and doors we built? We ain't going to get paid for them? We ain't got a severance? We don't got health care? I jumped in, and I called the bank, right? And I said, you're going to settle this case, but you better not close and not deny them their right. You know, said, I'm bravo. They were fearless, those workers at Chicago Windows and Doors. Yeah. And people can Google this, Chicago Windows 2008. Guess what they did? <laughs> they took over the factory. Wow. They wouldn't leave. They told the patrono, pues, no, we ain't leaving. We got the keys. We have the keys. <laughs> yeah. We know how this place runs. And guess what? We're not leaving because you can't just do this to us. And I went. And I took on the banks, right? 
big banks in the city of Chicago and the nation, and we took them on, and guess what? Hey, we got them nearly $3 million, cool. which meant that now they were going to get their health care, which the law. It's the law. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They were supposed to get their health care for three months, right. you know, this pa- severance package, so we made them straight. And then I remember going back to them and saying, here's the proposal, and they all voted. Because you had to have an election. No era just simple congresista ir a negociar con el banco. Right. I had to go yeah. back to the workers and say, hey, here's what you got. Here's what you had yesterday. Nothing. This is what we have today. We've worked on it. We think they're complying with the law. And they looked at me. I remember going to a strike and the union leader saying to me, Gutierrez, we got a great deal. We got a great deal. But I can't tell them that because we went on strike for 20 bucks an hour and we got 19.25. They're making 16. It's a great deal, Gutierrez. You know, they're getting $3.25. And I said, okay. I went to go talk to the workers. And I looked statistically. I had my staff investigate how in this area of work, how what the wages were across the country. And I went, I said, they're getting a good deal. Right. They're going to make more money more than, than these more. jurisdictions doing the same work are making. So I went back and I talked to them. You know what? They, they humbled me. They all went, Si Gutierrez dice, pues acabó la huelga, entonces. Mm. Él dice que esto es un buen trato. And it good, was. It's good, it's yeah. good. It's good, it's good. And sometimes you can't stand out there and say, we're not going to stop until it's excellent, until it's 20. Because guess what? Sometimes good is good. And for my immigrant community, we're going to always strive for excellency. But if I find a moment where it's good, and I get to take you out of the darkness and bring you out of the light of day, and you get to dial 911 to all those exploiters, right? And you get to raise your children without fear of being deported. I'm gonna say this is good. Right. But we need a national organization and we need Latinos to lead that. Take that lead. Right? To take that lead because we're the only ones that, that truly understand in many cases. And we have a lot of friends and a lot of allies, but we gotta lead it. We have to be a voice. So I wanna thank you guys for for having me on this has been great no no thank you um i do want to ask you something very quickly because we're uh, talking about leaders is uh is there anyone out there that that uh, a young latino leader that that you should um or we should all know about uh look into wow i would tell you support i'm i'm gonna tell you right now in the in the city of chicago i have to tell you I have a hard time mm. in the city of Chicago. I mean, I, I know how much I uh, admire Chewy right. and his work, but he old like me. All right, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know. Chewy's gonna 60, hear this. He's like, man, yeah, 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 he knows. <laughs> Everybody's gonna Google Jesus Garcia. Go, his birthday's gonna be there. Yeah. His it, mustache has been the same since the eighties. Yeah, right? That was that was, yeah, I, <laughs> hey, when I started. Remember when you look oh, at all? Yeah, the, yeah, you yeah. look at all the pictures of Luis. I have my mustache <laughs> too. <laughs> And then I had that that I had that that thing alopecia and a piece of it fell off and oh. so I trimmed the other piece and I, this is a true story and I go to a march right I forgot what it was for for labor for a march for some social something for social justice I can't right. remember what it was and as it would be Chewie and I were marching together and he said what kind of look are you going for with that mustache <laughs> you and, and I went. Okay, sometimes you can't trim this part of this part without making an allusion to somebody very ugly in the history of humanity. So I just, you know, I tried, I said, well, sin bigote. Ahora la gente, well, they forgot when I had the bigote. So yeah. I, but in the beginning, mira, porque te afeitaste. I said, well, I don't know. It was I signature. Piece here. It was, yeah. I had my bigote. But Chewy had a bigote. Mine was a Puerto Rican bigote. <laughs> It was, it, was, it, was, it was a little, you know, it was, thin, it was a thin one, the right? Thin, yeah. you know, thin line. <laughs> no, Chewy is thick, <laughs> and, you know, big. He had, a, he had a big old, you know, Chewy has a big old Mexican bigote. Right. I had the little Puerto Rican thin one. Uh, maybe that's why people don't remember it as much, right? It was, it was just thinner. Uh, I didn't shave my bigote as much, clearly, when I was young as Chewy did. Uh, Chewy started young. I, I, I used to let it grow at a very early stage. So, look, I think in the city of Chicago... I'm going to be very real with you guys. Yeah. I'm going to be here until next um, March because my daughter, Jessica, uh, is going to run for alderman of the 30th Ward. She's oh, going nice. to try it. She's going to try to do it again. Yeah. She, she missed it by 120 votes the last time, and she had a wonderful experience. She knows where to find them. And as her dad, 
I cannot go around the country, right, and leave my daughter here. So, yeah, we have our apartment in Puerto Rico. It ain't going to see me. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, it's, it's not going to see for you, me. Though. It's waiting no, for you. No, yeah, it's waiting for <laughs> me. It got to wait for me till next spring. Right. Uh, my apartment in Puerto Rico. I'm going to be here. We're going to have our nation's future. That's going to put me on the road. Okay. Uh, we're going to focus. Is that we in have, June, you said? In June, we announce it. Okay. But we're already going to have organizing meetings in Orlando, in Atlanta, uh, next week. I'm okay. going. We're we're making um, a meeting with all the local immigrant organizations, calling them together so I can explain the purpose. And then we have a meeting in um, in um, the first week of March, I'm sorry, of May, in Las Vegas, because Nevada is going to be important. And this morning I had a wonderful breakfast. Uh, we have a wonderful organizer. Um and she is going to organize a trip for me in the next month to go to Charlotte and mm-hmm. another one uh, to go to Arizona, to go to Phoenix. Um, so I'm going to be busy doing those things, mm-hmm. doing citizenship, voter education, and at the same try, try to avoid, try to organize nationally. And then, and my daughter's running. And so I got to tell you, I know I'm her dad, but I got to tell you, she, she's fearless. She's young. There you go. Um, she's fearless, she's young, and she's ready to change the world. And so I'm looking forward uh, yeah. to watching her do that. And um, so, yeah, so I have to answer the question honestly, not tell you the truth. Yeah, I think she's going to be a great dynamic leader of the go. city of Chicago and the country. And um, she's going to go back. That's where I started in Chicago City Council. Awesome. It's a good place to start, man. Yeah. Because guess what? I'll never forget the day that man knocked on my door. It was it was Sunday. It was four o'clock in the afternoon. He right. knocked on my door. He said, Gutierrez, my basement's flooded. And I told him, Senor, it's Sunday, it's four o'clock. You know, come back, you know, tomorrow's Monday. <laughs> City Hall is open. It opens at night. I'll help you. And he turned around, he said, You know something? When you come to my house to ask me to vote for you, you don't look at wow, what time of the man. day it is, man. You don't look if City Hall is open. You don't look if it's Monday, Sunday, Saturday. If my Saturday afternoon is being interrupted, I, I, I listen. Mm. Man, I, I closed the door. I was so embarrassed, you know, because he was right. Yeah. Guess what? My daughter learned those lessons. She ain't going to make the mistakes daddy made. You know what? The next time somebody knocked on my door, I opened it. They said, hey, my son's in trouble, Right? I said, come on in. So, Ori, hay café. Te gustaría una tacita de café? We made him some coffee. We sat down, and I talked to him. My home cannot be a place where I shelter myself from the world. Right. Right? I'm a public official, public. Right? So, you have to, if people know where you live, and they come to you, and they reach out to you with a problem, that's kind of what's wrong. So, I learned that. She's never going to make that mistake. Her door is going to be open anytime, any day, whenever the issue arises. So I think we need to learn more about that. And, and that's kind of been my experience. And, and I tell all the young people, go out there. I want you all to know the young people out there. In 1984, I ran for the first time against Dan Rostenkowski in March of 1984. I got 24.8% of the vote. Yeah, it's the only loss. If I was a boxer, I'd be 31 and 1. <laughs> okay? Nice. Uh, I did lose my first campaign. Right. I haven't lost since then. But I lost that first campaign. In October, they burned my house down. Hmm. I'm not making that up. They threw a brick through my front window at 3 in the morning and threw a gallon of gasoline into my house. Nice. And for those of you who say, that ain't a bomb, let me throw a gallon of gasoline at 3 o'clock in the morning oh, while yeah. you're sleeping upstairs and see how you consider it. Wow. It took my living room, my dining room. It just, luckily, you know, we escaped. But guess what? It didn't deter us. And I know we've talked about Chewy, but I got one picture. You know who showed up at my house the next day while they were boarding up the windows? Chewy did. And we weren't elected to jack shit yet. <laughs> Okay, right? No, I wasn't even working at City Hall. Oh, wow. No, I wasn't even working because I lost. Yeah, right. Right, so so, so Chewy came by and, you know, he knew what it was like to be a victim of, of violence. 
because Rudy Lozano was murdered right in his home in Little Village. He was like the next leader, right, of our Latino community, the up and coming <clears throat> leader. He was murdered in his own kitchen in his home. So Chewy knows what what violence is like. So I tell all the young people, look, go out there, organize, right? We need you more than ever before. This country is under attack. Just watch the news. Read the paper. Go on social. We're under attack. Many of the advances we've made, as I've expressed earlier, in terms of immigrant rights, LGBTQ, women's rights, labor rights, environmental rights, consumer rights, Mm -hmm. right? We're losing on all of those fronts, all of the gains that we made, all of the sacrifice that was put into it. Uh, I say, you know, it's always interesting to me, you know, that men want to control a woman's body, okay. right? And her reproductive system. Let's face it, that's what they want to do, right? But nobody ever wants to control a man's reproductive body, right? Nobody ever tells them what to do with their genitals, right? Mm-hmm. But they want to tell women what to do, right, with their reproductive bodies, right? But nobody ever tells them. And I got to tell you something. Um, you know, women are under attack in this country. I mean, ro- I mean, Karai, I mean, just think about it. Think about the things Trump said about women that we know were caught on tape. Right. Right? The horrendous things that he acted upon and how he appointed Supreme Court justices that were going to revoke women's rights. We're under attack all across this country. So guess what? It's not just Latino immigrants and the undocumented that need a movement and need the youth to participate and be fearless. All these different areas. Otherwise, do we really want to go back to a country, right, where a fifth grader like my Lucito has a fifth grade and everybody looks at the two dads strangely? Right. Right? Is that we really want to go back there where yeah, women's we don't right? Go, I don't want to go back we there. We don't want to regress. That's at all. I, I was there. Yeah. I was there. I had to purge myself, right? Of the bigotry and the prejudice that was inculcated in me, right? It was inculcated in me, right? I had to purge myself. It's a very cleansing, very liberating mm. thing to do. I don't want to purge. Guess what? My grandson, Lucito, he never had to purge jack shit. Right. Because he never had it. Yeah. He never had the disease of bigotry at any, right? He's always been free from it. So let's yeah. keep the country free from it. I agree 1,000%. This is the part where I ask my good friend Jesse here to give me his final thoughts on this amazing oh my goodness it, it, it's um i think it's so overwhelming to have somebody as powerful uh, uh right here in front of us uh tener el 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 orgullo de aquí de chicago y, y el orgullo de tenerla allí enfrente uh so much respect for you so much respect yes, thank you um you know we're we're I, you know, you just egged me on right now, just talking about all the stuff, and I'm like, we'll go knock on doors, we'll go, we'll, be, we'll, we'll go over here, like You're I like, want to yes, do it. Sign yeah. me up. I don't live over there, but we'll go knock on doors. Yeah. <laughs> you gotta, you got, you, let me just tell you, you gotta knock on the doors. Yeah. Right. Be fearless, and and you know what? You say, oh, I can't do a precinct. Great. Do your block. Do your block. Right. You yeah. know, do your block. Yeah, you can no. do your block. Those are your neighbors, <laughs> right? You all go out and. And then wash your cars and mow your lawns and, and you see them and you go to, you know, black club parties with them. And, and when they got a yard sale, you go buy <laughs> stuff from them and they buy stuff. You know, they're your neighbors. Yeah. Go talk to them. Yeah. I got to tell you, and Andy, one of my best exp- I never knocked on doors until Harold Washington ran for mayor of the city of Chicago. Uh-huh. And I wouldn't have knocked on mm. a door because I voted for him in the primary. Now he's the Democratic nominee and now they got Epton. Remember, Epton's slogan was, before it's too late. Yeah. Okay? Uh, vote for the white guy before it's too late, and the black guy wins right. before it's too late. With all the insinuations of before it's too late. Yeah. They came to my door. They said, oh, Mr. Gutierrez, Mr. Gutierrez, we see you're, you're voters, and, and, um, and you always vote. We looked at you. You're always coming out to vote. We have a great candidate for mayor, Epton. They tried to give me a before it's too late. I felt so insulted that somebody even <laughs> would think I would consider that, that I chased them, and I started knocking on doors. And I still talking. I still remember talking to the Latinos. I said, mira, hoy son los negros, mañana son los boricua, that they're going to do this to. There's going to be a day a Latino's going to want to be mayor of Porter, and they're going to use the same, same strategy, strategy against them. So, And the Latinos went, no, you're right. 
And so Latinos voted for Harold Washington. That was pretty cool. Yeah. Right? But, hey, I didn't knock on their doors. Then I went, there's, there was a black on Walmart. There was mostly uh, black people, African-Americans. I went on that block. I made appointments with all of them. <laughs> they were so happy to see somebody for Harold Washington. They were going, we didn't know anybody was out here in the Humble Park Latino neighborhood for Harold Washington. And there was this lady, uh, uh, Dolores. They tried to pick her up to go vote, the machine guys. They said, oh, no, no, I'm waiting for Gutierrez to pick me up. He's going to pick me up and take me to go vote. He's, he's the one who's and then I showed up at her house. I said, it's 10 o'clock. It's time for us to go vote. Yeah, they tried. But I told them, no, that you can take me to go vote. I got to make nice. sure. Because she was so proud. Yeah. You know, you could see that she was going to vote for Harold Washington. Yeah, yeah. She was finally going to get a chance. She was so proud. I was so happy to help facilitate that, put her in my little boat. I had a Volkswagen, not a Chevy. <laughs> <laughs> That's the other popular car in Puerto Rico, just so you know. Volkswagen. Uh, much to uh, the denigration of the stereotype. Right. Volkswagens are very big. Um, so I took her on my Volkswagen, and I knocked on door, and I still remember. I said, "We've got if we're going to win, we've got to talk to people that are not Latino and black only. We have to talk to white voters. And I, I knocked on my neighbor's Sorry. door and I said, how you doing? I said, I just got a question. He says, I told her, right? I paint the trim on my house. You never see any flaking paint on my house, right? I said, you see my new windows? You see my car? You never had to think about my muffler because I always fix it. I said, I'm on my lawn. They go, Gutierrez, you're a great neighbor. You take great care of your house. I said, great. Now that we've established that, you know what? I want you to vote for Harold Washington. Now, why? I wouldn't risk that house and everything I've invested in it. I'm a good neighbor. I wouldn't be bringing you somebody that thought I thought was going to bring harm. Right. And she looked at me and she said, okay. I remember on election day, she walked by me. She didn't really greet me too warmly. And she went in to vote because the precinct captain was there. Remember, this is a precinct captain. He's been a precinct captain for 35, 40 years, right? So and he shook hands, and then she looked around, and she winked at me. Mm. She gave me a wink. That was enough, brother. That yeah, was enough. You knew. I knew who she voted for, right. right? I mean, just changing the way mm -hmm. people look. Each person out there, not only young people, middle-aged people, older people, you can all do it. But it takes working on a block yeah. so that you can change a nation. Yeah. So let's nice. do it. Thank you. Agradecido. Agradecido. Muchísimas gracias. Thank, um, thank you so much. I, I'm very happy that you accepted. I'm very happy that you're here. Yes. I, I, I do believe that as as Obama heard you and, and he changed, and we all need to do that change. And that's the beautiful part about life that, uh, you know, we're not committed to. Or we shouldn't be married to our ideas all the time. We should accept change and go with it. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um, and thank you for uh, letting us be part of your final chapter, as you've always said, uh, you know, in, in, your, in your book of life. Thank yes. you very much. Thank you. Para toda la gente, keep following us on Apple Podcasts, on Spotify. Subscribe to YouTube. Thank you for a great season four. Casa Humilde, thank you very much. All of our sponsors, thank you for everything. A great season. La Pura Positiva, read a book. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> El Wattpad. Este episodio está patrocinado por nuestros compas de Casa Humilde Cervecería. Cerveza artesanal, elaborada aquí en Chicago, with a variety of 10 different styles to choose from. Casa Humilde is located at the District Brew Yards, 417 North Ashland in Chicago. Follow them on IG and like them on Facebook at Casa Humilde Cervecería. To check availability near you, go to www.casahumildechicago.com and check out the store locator. You could also pick up some chelas at the District Brew Yards. Casa Humilde Cervecería. Stay humilde. Este episodio está patrocinado por Tequila Tres Generaciones. At Tres Generaciones, we honor those driven to create something greater than themselves, those who have what it takes to leave a legacy. It's a tequila for the strivers, the hustlers, the champions of free will who create their destiny and don't await it. El proceso es único. It begins with fresh pressing agave, extrayendo el jugo antes que lo cocinen, resulting in reduced bitterness and a crisp agave forward flavor. Todo el tequila is triple distilled using 100% Blue Weber agaves. Con el tequila blanco, con el tequila reposado, it's certified organic. 
Aquí en el Wattpad, cuando hacemos un brindis, it has to be tequila tres generaciones. Celebrate responsibly. 40% alcohol by volume. Copyright 2021 Salsa Tequila Import Company, Chicago, Illinois. This Wattpad episode is brought to you by Borja's Law Group. El abogado Borjas contestará todas tus preguntas, explicará el proceso específico de inmigración que aplica en su caso, el tiempo que se toma procesar su caso y los costos asociados con las tarifas de inmigración y los honorarios legales. Llama al 312-788-2783 para programar tu cita. Y ahí de pasada, menciona el WACPAR para que te den tu consulta gratis. This episode is brought to you by Taquerías a Totonilco. Con más de 40 años de experiencia, hoy por hoy de los mejores tacos al pastor en todo Chicago y suburbios. Al igual con los tacos de asada, ni más ni menos. Sus famosas tortas y para terminar con ganas, un rico licuado. Les encargamos sus tres locales, 3916 al oeste de la 26 en Chicago, 500 East Cass Street en Joliet y 1631 al norte de la Mannheim Road en Stone Park. Para más información, visite www.taqueriasatotonilco.com. This episode is brought to you by Rancho Los Guzman. Hands down, one of the most beautiful rancho-style venues there is in the Chicagoland area. They offer all the necessary services so that your next event is unforgettable. From weddings, quinceañeras, VIP private events, and holiday corporate events. Relax and enjoy while they take care of every single detail. Book your next event at Rancho Los Guzman, 2225 Maple Road in Joliet. For more information, call 815-200-4713 or check out their website at rancholosguzman.com.